food, drink, everything. Should we, uh, I think maybe there's a plane coming from Washington that's still on its way or just landed recently, so folks are on their way, I think. Is that right? <coughs> yeah. Sir, <coughs> at my factory, I entertain people by singing and dancing. Would come you like up. me to Let's come go. up and entertain you all? <laughs> I was going to ask for a magician, but that's even better. <laughs> I do have a joke or two, too, I could give, but that's okay. I'm waiting. Don't use a little humor, right? <laughs> and I do sing also. <laughs> I could do chicken and some lizard cups. Sorry, I didn't mean to embarrass you, but I tried to break the silence. <laughs> I'm
hidden behind the sun. You get one for Senator Brown, too? Gave him my cushion. The field here of hearing of the Joint Select Committee and the Solvency of Multi-Employer Pension Plans will come to order. Thank you to my friend, Senator Portman, uh, for his work on this committee, his crucial work in this committee, uh, and for his help in bringing this hearing to Ohio. I'm grateful for that. I know we all are. Uh, a number of our colleagues will be arriving in a moment. Senator Manchin and I believe four House colleagues of the members on this committee will be here. I first of all thank the six of you as witnesses. I know what this means to you and I'm grateful for your engagement and involvement. Uh, thank you for that. Thanks to the thousands of Teamsters and mine workers and iron workers and carpenters and confectionery workers and bakers and others who have come to Columbus both yesterday and today. They represent uh, more than a million workers, Americans around the country who are at risk of losing their pension. That's why we're here. We all know that's why we're here. It's because of their activism that we created this committee and we must be successful. I want to acknowledge one of those very special people here sitting next to my very special wife. I can't leave her Connie Schultz out. But one of those very special people is my friend Rita Lewis. Rita, I, we normally don't do this in committees, but stand up if you would. Thank you. Uh, Senator Manchin, thank you for joining us too. Rita's late husband, Butch Lewis, uh, was president of Teamsters Local 100 in Rob's hometown of Cincinnati, actually in Evendale, but close enough, and uh, was an activist on this, and his banner has more than been taken up by um, his widow and his wonderful wife, Rita. So Rita, thank you. Butch had helped lead the fight to save his fellow Teamsters pension. He passed away too soon, fighting for the retirement security they earned. Rita's continued this fight. We honored his memories by naming his bill, our, our bill, after him, the Butch Lewis Act. Rita once told me that retirees and workers struggling with this crisis feel like they are invisible. And Rob and I and others took that to heart so that neither you are invisible, nor the thousands, nor, nor Mike Walden, nor the literally hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people that, whose pensions are threatened. Um, you aren't invisible to Senator Manchin. You're not invisible to Senator Portman. You're not invisible to Representatives Neal and Scott and Norcris and Dingell and every member of this committee. We wouldn't be here without your involvement. We see you, we hear you, we're here for, to fight for the solution you deserve. Today is about listening to your stories. You've heard the numbers, 1.2 million pensioners in the United States, 60 plus thousand pensioners in, in Ohio, in the state Rob and I represent. It threatens current workers who are paying into pensions they might never see a penny of if we don't act. It threatens thousands of small businesses, construction companies, manufacturing companies, trucking companies especially. It threatens our economy. It affects every American in every state in this country. It affects union workers. It affects non-union workers. That's why we see groups as diverse as the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and labor unions and the AARP all pushing for a solution. We know it won't be easy. We created this committee bipartisanly and made it an right down the middle, eight Republicans, eight Democrats, to pass something, we need five Republicans, five Democrats. We knew this would be bipartisan. We knew it had to be. The next, the, the, com the committee has conducted a dozen bipartisan staff briefings with at least 10 more to come. We've received thousands, literally thousands of comments online at pensions.senate.gov. The next step is for members to sit down to begin the next round of, I underscore, bipartisan negotiations. Uh, Rob, I'm, I'm glad you're on this committee. I appreciate the work you've done. I think people in Ohio know that Senator Portman and I have a history 
I would say, not quite unique in Congress, but unusual in the Senate, have a history of putting bipartisanship and talking points that all of us use aside. We've gotten things done, whether it's leveling the playing field and fighting for the steel industry, fighting for workers, fighting for Ohio jobs in places like the Whirlpool plant in Clyde, whether it's making sure that the health coverage tax credit got extended for the Delphi retirees, Rob and I worked on that together, whether it's funding the Great Lakes cleanup, we worked on that together, or passing laws to combat the opioid epidemic, we all appreciate his leadership on that, and we work together on that. The people in this room know how he and I work together. It's why both senators, both Ohio senators, have had strong support from the UMWA and the Teamsters. They know the two of us put partisanship aside and put Ohio's working families first. They trust us to put that same effort into solving this together. I've put out a proposal, the Butch Lewis Act. I think it's a good place to start. But everyone here knows we don't get anything unless we work together. That's why I'm open to any solution that protects workers and retirees and businesses. I'm ready and willing to, to, to make changes or to work on new solutions. I want to hear any idea that brings us closer to a bipartisan compromise. Too much is at stake to retreat into partisan corners. Rob, you said this before, I agree, we have to get away from talking points, we have to listen to all ideas, we have to work in good faith. That's what the people in this room expect, that's what people at chambers of commerce and union halls around the country expect, that's what millions of retirees expect. I want to thank everyone here today for making your voices heard. You have refused to give up when members of Congress were not so much listening to you, you made sure that all of us did. I yield to Senator Portman for his opening statement. Rob. Thank you. Thanks, Sherrod. Thank you, Sherrod, and how great to be here in Ohio. Uh, Mike was just asking me, uh, are, are you glad to be here? And I said, any place but D.C. <laughs> yeah, it's great to be here. But more than that, it's great to be here with, uh, with a bunch of friends uh, from Ohio who are going to have the chance to tell their stories here on this panel. Uh, Rita, good to see you. Uh, echoing the comments of Sherrod, thank you for raising the the issue and being sure that my colleagues know from both sides of the aisle and both sides of the Capitol how important this issue is. Uh, I want to welcome these colleagues. They've come from really all over the country to be here today. And uh, it shows that they're interested in hearing directly from Ohioans who are so impacted by the impending multi-employer pension crisis. And we need to hear these stories. Uh, as I know is the case of all my colleagues up here on the panel, we've all spent many hours hearing the stories from folks we represent. Uh, from retirees, from their spouses, from their families. Uh, stories like uh, Jack Palush. I saw Jack earlier here today, and I said, Jack, I want to talk about you a little bit. And he said, as long as it's good. <laughs> I said, well, we'll see. Uh, but Jack is a Teamster, Marine Corps veteran from North Royalton, Ohio. Uh, he worked at USF Holland and a number of other trucking companies for over 37 years. And uh, what Jack was told was what so many of you in this room were told, which is your pension's all paid up. And uh, so he took less of a pay raise sometimes, he took less of a vacation sometimes, uh, because more went into the pension. And the pension was all paid up. Uh, but it wasn't paid up. Today, if nothing is done, uh, in seven short years, Jack's pension will likely be cut by about 90 percent. 90 percent. That's just seven years from now, 90 percent. So, Senator Brown, I appreciate what you said a moment ago, I really do, uh, that we've got to figure out how to come closer to a solution here, and it's got to be bipartisan in order to pass. Uh, frankly, the way this committee was set up, it's got to be super bipartisan, because I think there are, what, 16 of us on this committee, and out of that 16, 10 of us have to come together, and it's worse than that, uh, or better than that, if you believe in bipartisanship, as we all do, which is it's got to be five of eight Democrats and five of eight Republicans. And if we get that, uh, then we have something that's very unusual, which is the ability to take it to the floor of the House and the Senate for an up or down vote. And I can't tell you how important that is in the Senate, as, as Senator Manchin and Senator Brown will tell you, because any individual senator could otherwise block it, uh, which would be really tough. I would say impossible. So that's our, our goal here, as Senator Brown said well, was to figure out how to find that common ground. 
And the first thing you do, I think, is you hear from people, because we've got to understand the severity of the problem in order to get more people on board with some of the tough solutions. And stakeholders like Jack and others haven't been shy, and that's good. This hearing's a chance to get those facts so that we can come together on at least agreeing on the problem and raising the visibility of the problem. That's why what happened here in Columbus yesterday was so important, because frankly, I, I did some interviews today, and people were saying, well, it was a very peaceful demonstration. And I said, well, yeah, they're, they're very peaceful, but they're very determined, you know, and they just want to get the information out uh, to everybody else because there's going to be some tough decisions to be made. Here in Ohio, we've got more than 60,000 active workers and retirees um, heading toward insolvency if we don't do something, so that makes Ohio uh, particularly hit hard, but other states represented here in this panel also have a lot of retirees and, again, their families who are going to get hit hard. Uh, we've also here in Ohio got a lot of small businesses that are hit by this. And if you look at Ohio, we've got more than 200 businesses in the central state's pension fund alone. By the way, about 90 percent of those are small businesses. So if we don't do something, it's also going to force some of these small businesses out of business. And we're going to hear from some of these small business owners here today. We've had three hearings in Washington, D.C., and that's great. Uh, but I think it's really good to get out in the field and to hear directly from people back in the home state. So, um, in these three hearings we've already had, we've been told about what's going to happen because of inaction if central states uh, and the mine workers 1974 pension plan and PBGC all become insolvent. And um, there are lots of other unfunded multi-employer plans, and I've talked to some folks here today who are with other plans, but I mentioned those two big ones because if either of those two big ones go down, uh, I believe that that means that PBGC would become insolvent also just one of those two. So this is a critical national issue. And of course, it's a personal crisis for people like Jack and over 60,000 other Ohio participants in these plans. The second hearing we had, uh, we heard from PBGC Director Tom Reeder. That's the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation, the insurance fund, basically. And he said that after the PBG runs out of assets, incoming premium levels will be able to finance only one-eighth of current PBGC financial assistance payments to insolvent plans. And PBGC, remember, only insures the promised pensions in a multi-employer plan up to about 50 percent. That's about the average in, in the uh, central states plan. So think about that. One-eighth and only 50 percent, that's where I come up with the 90 percent figure. That means that for a typical central states retiree, the cut would be about 90 percent. In our third hearing we had in Washington, we heard from employers and we heard from private sector experts about several potential scenarios under current law that could result in a wave of bankruptcies among employers when central state becomes insolvent. Now, you know, hard to predict exactly what's going to happen, but common sense will tell you, and I think you'll hear from some small business folks later, that that wave of bankruptcy has the potential to create an economic contagion effect. In other words, it would spread around our economy that would lead to additional pension plans collapsing and also serious impacts, of course, on, on the economy. And, uh, you know, the big risk to the broader economy is something we've got to talk about because that way everyone is affected. To me, this is, of course, completely unacceptable. We can't let this happen. And our principal objective has to be to pass these reforms now. By the way, the sooner we do it, the less expensive it is. That's why we're meeting today, to get all the input. We have a lot of questions that must ultimately be answered in order to successfully arrive at this bipartisan solution we've been talking about. Um, to me, none is more important than determining the right balance to fix the problem in a way that can get support across the board. We talked about getting the support on this panel alone is going to be a challenge because we, we have a supermajority we've got to achieve. But we also have to go to the American people, don't we? And we've got a lot of tough questions. The first one is how much should come from taxpayers? Uh, by the way, retirees and active workers who are at risk are taxpayers too, and I get that. But let's be honest with each other today. About 99 percent of the taxpayers who are going to be asked to contribute to something through the government, general revenues, uh, are not in these affected plans. And for a lot of those people, uh, and I hear from them, I can tell you, as do many of my colleagues, I'm sure, uh, they're having a tough time with their retirement too. So they may have a 401k or they may have an IRA, or if they're fortunate, they have a pension. Uh, but they're underfunded, despite the efforts. I see Richie Neal here. Many of us have worked on expanding retirement savings. We've done a good job in the last 10 or 15 years. We've expanded it some, but still, 
almost half of Americans have no retirement nest egg at all, which is a real problem. But I'm just saying that's a reality we have to think about as we're going through this process. Another question uh, that we've got to focus on is we've got to understand more about what levels of PBGC premium increases for employers can this system bear without putting contributing employers out of business and therefore hurting more workers and decreasing overall PBGC revenues. So that's a balance, isn't it? Uh, people talk about shared responsibility, including employers. You've got to be careful you don't go too far, otherwise you have uh, a reaction that's counterproductive. I believe, ultimately, shared responsibility between all stakeholders is the only solution that we're going to be able to pass and the only solution the American people will perceive as fair. And I also believe it can be done. After this hearing, I believe the committee should hold bipartisan member meetings. And I also believe we ought to have another public hearing focusing on the solutions. Because we've had good hearings, this will be a great hearing, but it's been more about getting input and understanding the problem and raising the level of consciousness. It hasn't been about so much what should the solutions be. And by the way, we need to know how much they cost. We need to get good analysis from the Congressional Budget Office, which is the numbers we've got to live with here on this panel. We've got to get numbers from the PBGC. There are some numbers out there, you know, for various proposals that are pretty darn high. And we just got to figure this out. Uh, we got to be transparent about it. And I think that sort of a hearing is necessary to do that. As some of you know, I've been frustrated. We don't have the final numbers on a lot of these proposals. Kind of tough to make a decision if you don't have the numbers. But for today's purposes, again, we shouldn't take any options off the table for a comprehensive solution. I agree with what Senator Brown said earlier. We should listen carefully about what's at stake for active workers, retirees, employers, and our economy. And we should further solidify our understanding of the nature of the problem, the severity of the problem, the fact that we have to act. Workers and retiree, by the way, deserve a voice in what happens to the pensions that they earned. Employers who could be put out of business deserve to be heard, too. None of these stakeholders are given any public hearings during Congress's consideration of the Multi-Employer Pension Reform Act, which passed over my objections back in 2014. I think it would have been a better bill had they had public hearings and listened to people. So even after this hearing, any solution going forward must include input from retirees and active workers and those who are affected. Look, I know solving this is not going to be easy. There are no easy solutions, otherwise it would have been done already. But today's hearing will make a valuable contribution toward developing that solution. And I think it will strengthen Washington's political will to get there, because that's what it's going to take. And to get to a solution that's comprehensive, that's fair, and that's balanced. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Portman. Uh, before I introduce the witnesses, I want to just uh, welcome uh, my fellow members of the House and Senate to, to Columbus. Uh, Congressman Bobby Scott from Virginia, Senator Joe Manchin from West Virginia, Representative Richie Neal from Massachusetts, uh, Representative Norcross from New Jersey, and Dingle from Michigan. So thank you all. And they all have, um, they bring a lot of expertise to this as working on a whole host of issues in their careers and bring a lot of perspective from a pretty wide cross-section of the country. Uh, my honor to, to, to introduce the six witnesses, then will we begin with you, Mr. Martin, in testimony, and then we will all do an, at least one, probably two or three rounds of questions, and we're going to try to keep members' questions to five minutes segments as we do this. Uh, Bill Martin is president of Spangler Candy Company up in northwest corner of the state in Bryan, Ohio. Uh, he's enjoyed a 30-year career in accounting and finance, which began at the former Big Four accounting firm Arthur Young in Toledo. He graduated from Bowling Green in 1988 with a BS in accounting. He's active in the local community as a member of St. Patrick's Catholic Church in Bryan. He and Donna, his wife of 20 years, have 28 years, have four grown children and two grandchildren, and I understand one more on the way. Congratulations on that. Uh, uh, Roberta Dell's chief union steward at Spangler in Bryan, Ohio. Uh, Ms. Dell spent 46 years working at the Spangler Candy Company. She's the chief union steward, sell the position for almost 10 years. Uh, she serves as the primary contact for Spangler employees with their union, Teamsters Local 20, which is headquartered in Toledo with a, obviously a big local in Bryan. She has three sons, two granddaughters. Her son Charlie, along with his wife Rebecca, work alongside Roberta at Spangler Candy. 
It's a very much, I've been to that plant a number, it's a very much a family friendly company. She resides in Bryan where she's lived most of her life. David Gardner is CEO at Alfred Nich Nichols Bakery in Navarre, Ohio, known as the home of both Nichols and our former Congressman, the late Ralph Regula. David's worked in Nichols Bakery since 1971. He worked his way up to CEO, graduate of Ohio Wesleyan, the chairman of the board of the Long Company Bakery and Competitor cooperative headquarters in Chicago, Illinois. David's a veteran of the United States Air Force. And I told him when I was growing up in Mansfield, Ohio, uh, I th always, we ate Nichols bread. I always thought Nichols was located in Mansfield, Ohio. What would a kid know? Uh, Larry Ward is a retired coal miner, former president of United Mine Workers of America, District 6 out of Hopedale. Larry Ward is from, is where Larry Ward lives in Hopedale with his wife, Laura. They've been married 54 years. They have a son and a daughter. They've lived in Ohio all their lives. Larry's a third generation coal miner who followed his grandfather, father, and two brothers into the coal mines when he started working in 1966 at the Wyano Coals, called Wyano Coal Company, Nelms Number Two Mine in Hopedale. He held various positions in the local union. April 1987, he was elected to the UMWA's District 6 Executive Board. He was elected District 6 President in January 1989. He served in that position until he retired about 12 years ago, something like that. Brian Sloan is an apprentice instructor, Millwright Local 1090 out of Dayton. Uh, he's a resident of Dayton. He joined the Millwrights in 2006, where he served his four-year apprenticeship. He took the skills he learned. He created a career in rebuilding turbines in the power generation industry. He worked his way up to project manager, where he directed Millwright work on large-scale new construction and rehabilitation projects. In the spring of 8, 2018, Brian became a Millwright training instructor. He now works as a constructor in the same facility where he earned his journeyman card, teaching others the trade and mentoring them. Uh, for a successful career. He's the father of two young daughters and has been married to Jessica for 13 years. Michael Walden from Cuyahoga Falls, Ohio, served in the Marine Corps from 1967 to 1971. Like so many Teamsters and coal miners, Mike's a Vietnam veteran. Uh, he was 15 months of boots on the ground in service to our country. Mike has four daughters, nine grandchildren, retired Teamsters, worked for 31 years for Roadway Express, Local 24 Akron. Finally, Mike is one of the founders and the current president of the National United Committee to Protect Pensions, a nonpartisan organization that advocates for pensions that have been earned through the collective bargaining process over a lifetime of work. Mike, thank you. Mr. Martin, we'd like to hear first from you. Thank you, Senator Brown. Uh, and members of the Joint Select Committee, thank you for all of your work. I'm sorry? Is it on now? Members of the Joint Select Committee, uh, thank you for your work thus far on this important issue, and thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today. The Spangler Candy Company is a 112-year-old family-owned confectionery manufacturer based in a small community of 8,000 in Bryan, Ohio. We are the Dum Dums lollipop capital of the world, making 12 million Dum Dums every single day. We also make candy canes, Marshmallow Circus Peanuts, and Safety Pops. We are the largest manufacturing employer in our city, employing 550 hardworking Americans. Bryan is a great community and a great place to raise a family. We like to think we are the sweetest town in America. <laughs> We're in our fourth generation of Spangler family management, which is extremely rare. But that's not all. We have had many families in our community work here for multiple generations. Roberta Dell is just one fine example of our employees, and we have many, many more. Like many other employers in the multi-employer pension plans, our very future is at risk due to the multi-employer funding crisis. We became a Teamster shop in 1959 and entered the Central States pension in 1972. For our Teamster employees, we now contribute $6,300 per year for about 20% of their total wages to central states. Just 10 years ago, in 2008, we were contributing $3,400 per year. Our contribution rate has nearly doubled in the past 10 years. For someone to say employers aren't paying their fair share 
is just sadly mistaken and uninformed. No other cost we have has increased 85% in the past 10 years, like our pension costs. The real sad truth is our Teamster employees, like Roberta, will only receive a fraction of their promised retirement benefits because the central state's pension plan is going to fail. Tom Nyhan, the central state's executive director, has already stated that beginning in January of 2025, the central state's retirement benefits will have to be cut. According to central states, 54% of our contribution dollars go to pay benefits of participants whose employers are no longer contributing to the fund. That's more than half. These participants have never once worked for Spangler Candy Company. As a result of all these unfunded pension liabilities, Spangler's employer withdrawal liability is in the tens of millions of dollars, going up to 12 to 15 percent per year, and it seems to have little correlation to our own active workers or retirees. Regarding withdrawal liability, we never signed up for it. We entered central states in 1972, well before Congress passed employer withdrawal liability and last man standing rules in 1980. These outdated rules affect the very future of our company and must be addressed. Let me share a hypothetical example of how the withdrawal liability rules can stifle growth. Let's say we needed to hire 100 new employees to expand in Bryan, Ohio. It'd be a great story for our town. Everyone would be excited, except for this. Based on our own estimates, adding 100 new employees in Bryan could increase our withdrawal liability by more than $200,000 per each new employee, or $20 million total. That's outrageous. Why would we do that? Right now, there are 130 plans careening towards insolvency, affecting 1.3 million participants and 5,400 employers. These plans need to be stabilized right away before more employers file bankruptcy and exit these plans and worsen the problem for the remaining employers like Spangler. I believe some form of a long-term, low interest rate federal loan is needed to provide stability to these troubled plans and prevent catastrophic consequences for the multi-employer system. Given the enormity of the problem, I believe sacrifices may, need, may be needed to stabilize these plans. Having some additional tools then going forward to provide retirement benefits that are portable and predictable is also critical. Overall, there are 1,300 multi-employer pension plans affecting 10 million participants and 200,000 employers who ultimately could be affected if we do nothing. In central states, the vast majority of 1,335 contributing employers are small businesses like us. This issue hinders the success and growth of our businesses who already struggle to be competitive. We can do this, and we must do this. There's just too much at stake. I know our Bryan community would be affected forever if we weren't there making candy every day. We are the business leaders in our community. We help fund our schools, our city, and many charitable organizations. There would be no one to replace what we do for our small community. And this is just one story. There could be thousands more just like this in communities all across the country. We must not let that happen. Roberta Dell, after 46 years of impeccable service to our company, deserves to retire without fear of losing her retirement benefits. And so do all of our employees, for that matter. Please work together now to help solve these issues before it's too late. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Martin. Um, Ms. Dell, before you begin, try to bring the microphones a little closer to your to your um, mouths, all of you. And just um, there is, it's a little awkward to have it this way, but there is a time, the, the, the screen, it's, you're not really going to be looking in that direction, I understand, but do, do your best. But, yeah. um, but pull that close to your mouth so we can hear you. But Ms. Dell, thank you. And you had a good introduction for Mr. Martin. And you both should know that uh, if you come to Senator Portman's office or my office in the main office in the Capitol, in the, in the office buildings, we all have um, Dum Dum available to all Ohioans for free. So thank you for that. Thank you. <laughs> We've checked with Senate ethics laws and all that. So okay. anyway, Ms. Dell, welcome again. Thank you for coming all the way to Columbus. 
Dear members of the Joint Select Committee, I come before you today to tell you that I believe in you, that I have faith that you all will come together as a united body for, to find a solution for this nightmare that so many of us are living. On behalf of my coworkers, friends, and people I have never met, I would like to thank you for allowing me to speak with you today. This has been a privilege and an honor. My name is Roberta Dell. I have worked at Spangler Candy Company for 46 years and am 40, and 65 years old. I am the chief union steward for Spangler employees and proud to say I belong to the Teamsters Local 20 of Toledo. I love my job and I take pride in being able to say I work at the factory that makes Dum Dum Suckers. Spangler Candy Company is a great place to work and we have a good working as union and company together. I could tell you more of the facts about Spanglers, but Bill Martin, president of Spangler Candy Company, has already done that. <laughs> I am here to tell you my story, a story of sadness, desperation, and hope. I have worked hard all my life, most times holding down two or three jobs. I met my husband, Jim Dell, at Spangler Candy Company, where he also worked for 42 years. Jim also was a participant of the Central States Pension Plan. I never planned on working in a factory all my life, but we were blessed with three sons, Taylor, Charlie, and Sam, and over the years, life swiftly passed. We were taking care of each other and our boys, but before I knew it, I was in my 50s and I thought, oh crap, retirement is just around the corner and I am not prepared financially for it. We had helped our kids with college expenses and etc. Then, then the bombshell hit. Jim found out in 2004 he had stomach cancer. And then in 2014, he told me he had liver cancer and there wasn't much hope. This wasn't our plan. We were to take care of each other. This wasn't supposed to happen to us. We had planned on seeing our sons get married and give us grandchildren, but God had other plans. On June 2nd, 2015, Jim passed away with all three sons by his side, which was his last wish. Our oldest son was married four days later in New York City. And then we had to return home to bury their dad. It was a very difficult time. He thought he had taken care of all of us. Because I was still working and in pretty good health, I would have had my pension and Social Security to fall back on. I would be OK. So Jim took care of our sons in his will with, our, with my blessing. We were going to take care of each other, but Jim was gone. And I started to ask myself, who is going to take care of me? And now, what was I going to do? I now sit here before you with sadness and desperation. I have planned to work until age 68, but with the uncertainty of the pension, I don't know if that will be possible. I'm, the, I'm not the only one. So many I have talked with are in similar situations. Several are now finding they are raising their grandchildren. Many are living paycheck to paycheck. People who have lost their jobs and had to start over after losing their savings. Some have had a medical medic, major medical issue that has drained all their savings for retirement. They, like me, thought our pensions would be there for them, and they didn't have to worry. None of us thought we would be in this position living from paycheck to paycheck with our futures in such uncertainty. I have always felt the pension all these 46 years has been my savings. We need your help. Please find in your hearts to put differences aside and become united to find a solution. Like so many others, I, I look to you. I believe in you. Have hope and faith in you to help us find a way to save us from this nightmare we are all facing. I'm so sorry that I have uh, been so emotional, but this is so close to my heart. I'm just one of the little guys out there but that have worked so hard as I have, and we are all looking to you to help us find a, make a decision that will help each and every one of us that are sitting in this room and those that are sitting outside I thank you for your, t your time and for your hard work, and God bless you. Thank you, Ms. Dell. Thank you for your courage coming here and telling your story and your 
uh, just unrelenting advocacy for your brothers and sisters, some whom you don't even know, so thank you for that. Mr. Gardner, welcome to the committee. Thank you. <laughs> I would like to thank the Joint Select Committee on the Solvency of Multi-Employer Pension Plans for their bipartisan effort, for their sense of urgency to address this most serious matter that affects those who have earned and who are receiving pensions and those who are earning pensions but not yet receiving them and for the opportunity to submit my testimony today. I am honored to testify before the Joint Select Committee. My name is David Gardner. I'm very proud of my profession. I am a baker. My grandfather was Alfred Nichols, a Swiss immigrant who founded Alfred Nichols Bakery in Navarre, Ohio in 1909, 109 years ago. I remember my grandma's house. It was right next to the bakery. Our annual revenue is $165 million. In a good year, our company has a 1% profit. We pr have approximately 1,300 employees. 90% are in unions. We contribute to five multi-employer pension funds. Here are three grim st statistics about our company. Our unfunded pension liability is $281 million. In 2008, this liability was $93 million. So since that time, our unfunded pension liability has tripled. Number two, our pension cost last year was $13.8 million. In 2008, our pension cost was 8.1. In nine years, our pension cost has increased $5.7 million. But today, we have 461 less, em fewer employees. So if we had the same number of employees today that we had in 2008, last year our pension costs would have been $8.1 million higher. As one legislative assistant said to me, how are you still in business? We do, why do we have 461 fewer employees? We used to have 51 thrift stores. We, are, we now have, or are going to have, two. We used to have 18 production lines at our Navarre Bakery. We now have seven. Our pension costs are too high. I have some questions for the Joint Select Committee and for everybody here today. Number one, what did we do wrong? Number two, why is our business worth nothing? Number three, was the Joint Select Committee created to make an make multi-employer pension funds solvent or change laws and help save businesses that generate revenue for the pensions for their employees. We are looking forward to the action that the Joint Select Committee will take to design changes to laws to benefit retirees and benefit those companies who provide the pensions. The Joint Se Select Committee, in my opinion, was created to save pensions and to save jobs. Is it fair for multi-employer pension funds to put companies out of business due to rehabilitation plans that require huge contribution increases per employee per week? Another question, why can't we switch to a 401k plan? Next, why can't we get out of a multi-employer pension plan without triggering unfunded pension liability? Why should our employees have to worry about their pensions? Why should our company have to fund the pensions of people who never work for Nichols Bakery? We froze our non-union pension plan in 2016 because we could not afford it. Why can't we freeze our union pension plans that we cannot afford? When I was in Washington on April 25th with eight other family business owners, one congressman asked our group, do you have a plan? We do not. We did not. But here are four recommendations from us, from me. All multi-employer pension plans with a certain level of underfunding must be immediately frozen. These pension plans cannot sustain themselves. Companies must have the right to help fund 401k plans for their employees and be able to withdraw from multi-employer pension funds without liability. 
The contributions made by a participant to multi-employer pension plans, I believe, must go back to the participant. Based on the contributions, then the participants and the unions will determine pension amounts for retirees, for current employees, for employees who left but who were vested. And last, I believe the government must decide how to fund the pensions of orphans, the employees and the companies that went out of business. So why am I here? I am here representing the employees of Nichols Bakery. They are our people. They are my friends. I am concerned with one group of people, our employees, and their families. I write a personal note to every single employee who retires from our company. I personally go out in the bakery and thank every single person who is retiring from our company. I talk about their first day worked. I talk about what they did when they were at the bakery. And I thank them and they thank me for our jobs. Every business owner in this room wants to see their employees get a pension. But every business owner in this room has the responsibility to fight and to keep their businesses perpetuating, growing, and surviving. I am fighting for the jobs of our employees. With the present laws in place regarding multi-employer pension plans, business owners are in a game they cannot possibly win. Mr. Gardner, thank you for your insight. Uh, Mr. Ward, welcome. Chairman Brown, Senator Boardman, and distinguished members of the Joint Select Committee. My name is Larry Ward, and I live in Hope, Ohio with my wife, Laura. I am 74 years old and my wife is 72 years old and both of us have lived in Ohio all our life. My grandfather, father, and two brothers worked in the coal mines. I started working at the Wino Coal Company, Noms Number 2 Mine in Hopedale in November 1966. I loved working in the mine, but it was physically demanding and dangerous work. I began working in the mines before the passage of the Mine Safety Law, Mine Safety and Health Act of 1969. Miners were dying by the hundreds and even thousands every year, but after the Farmington No. 9 disaster in West Virginia that killed 78 miners, including Senator Manchin's uncle, Congress recognized that it had to act to save lives, and it did. I suggest to the committee that there is another disaster looming in the coal fields today, slower moving than a mine explosion, but effectively just as deadly. That disaster is a crisis confronting the UMWA 1974 pension fund that you are tasked with solving. The fate of more than 105,000 current and future UMWA retirees and widows is in your hands. Like most retired coal miners, I have several medical problems. I've suffered a heart attack, a cancer survivor, and have high blood pressure. My wife has similar problems. We have, you have heard that the average mine worker pension is $582 per month. My mind pension is short of that average. Most of the men I worked with, or their widows, are short of it as well. We have health care, but paying for deductibles and prescription co-pays and other health care costs makes the pension very important. We have the same monthly bills as everyone else. The pension, while not large, allows UMWA retirees across Ohio and the United States to pay these bills. I am here before you today and tell you that for most of the retirees I know, any reduction to their pension will make paying the bills very difficult, if not impossible. Here's just one example from a local union. One member is 75 years old and his wife is 70 years old. They have significant medical problems. His pension is $296 per month. I could go on and list different members of my local union here and the story would be the same. I'm sure you already know about the legislation that has been proposed that will fix the UMWA 1974 pension plan called the Miners, American Miners Protection Act. I know it doesn't solve every pension fund problem and we support preserving everyone's pension. But the AMP Act is the only pension legislation that has bipartisan support in both houses of Congress. In this day and age, that's got to count for something. The AMT Act predecessor, the Miners Protection Act, had widespread support in both houses of Congress and across party lines. It was passed by the Senate Finance Committee in 2016 by an overwhelming 18 to 8 vote. 
with the bipartisan support of both co-chairs of this Joint Select Committee, as well as Senator Portman and Crapo. It would have been protected both health care and pension for retired minors, their dependents and widows. There were significant votes in both Senate and House to pass it had it been allowed to come to the floor for a vote, but it never did. In the end, we were able to pass that, that part that preserved health care for 22,600 retirees, but a great opportunity to preserve our pension was wasted. Our pension fund is on a path to insolvency by 2022 if this committee does not act. Because of a string of coal company bankruptcies beginning in 2012, we have lost more than $100 million in annual contributions to our fund, and those companies have been relieved of more than $3.1 billion in withdrawal liabilities. We have one major employer left that is contributing more than 85% of all contributions to our fund. If that employer declares bankruptcy and is relieved of his contribution obligation and its withdrawal liability, then the UMW 1974 plan faces insolvency much sooner than 2022. American coal miners put their lives and our limbs on the line every single day so that this country could have the power it needed to make our economy the strongest in the world. For all the years that I was a miner and later as a union representative, when we negotiated a contract, we took money we could have had in hourly wages and put it toward our retiree health care and pensions because we knew we would need it. So when I hear people say we should pay for solving a problem we did not cause or we should be okay with taking cuts in our pension, I say this, we have already paid for our pensions. The big banks and financiers in, or on Wall Street caused this problem when they, their greed put this country into the recession of 2008. And Congress sent them $627 billion as a thank you. The Wall Street cooks use that to pay themselves huge bonuses. We use our pension to pay for medicine and food and heat. There is something wrong with this picture. Along with my fellow retirees, I pray every day that the committee will find a solution to this problem. Thank you for this opportunity to testify before the committee, and I will answer any questions as you may, as best as I can. Thank you, Mr. Ward, and thank you for Thank you for decades of mining coal that turned the lights on in this hearing room. Thank you. Mr. Sloan, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first, I'd like to thank you all for understanding this is a bipartisan issue and working together. It's very important to many Americans across the United States. Uh, my name is Brian Sloan. I'm from Dayton, Ohio. I'm a proud 13-year member of Millwright Local 1090 and a participant in the Southwest Ohio Carpenter Pension Plan. Our plan is in critical and declining status. It is currently in the MPRA process with the Treasury Department. Over the last 20 years, our area covering the pension plan has seen drastic reduction in work opportunities due to the prolonged decline in the industry. In other words, all of our jobs went south. This has led to a significant problem with our pension plan. In 1998, our pension plan was over 100% funded. Existing law at that time would not allow us to have an overfunded pension, allowing us not to create a rainy day fund. We worked with national leadership and contractors associations to change this law, but we were denied by both Congress and the Clinton administration. So we were forced to increase benefits to get us below 100% funded. Soon after, we, had, we entered a two-year recession. By the time it was over, the plan was 66% funded. In 2008, the stock and housing market crisis, followed by the Great Recession, and the resulting seven years construction depression in the Southwest wiped out the recovery of the previous recession and left the plan funding at 45%, resulting in losses from which the, con the fund cannot recover using MPRA. Some have said don't use MPRA, have the active members and the employees pay more to fix this pension fund. While that seems like an easy solution, it really isn't. Active members and employers have already carried the extra cost of fixing the plan since 2000. A participant who retired in 2016 will receive 20% less in monthly benefits than a participant who, re who worked the same amount of hours but retired in 2000. Similar participant who retires in 2030 will receive 40% less than that same employee who retired in 2000. 
A participant, or sorry, similar, the 2030 retiree has contributed three and a half times more than the 2000 retiree, but receives a benefit of about two thirds of the person who retired in 2000. To put this in dollar terms, since the 2000 recession, the fund has repeatedly cut back the benefits received by the members who were active at that time. Because of these cuts, a fund participant who had current benefits can now expect a pension that is around 30% less than a similar person who retired in 2000. For example, a participant with 30 years of service working 1,500 hours a year would have contributed approximately $85,000 over their work year and receive a monthly benefit of 3,100. A, re a participant retiring in 2016 would have contributed 153,000 and he would receive only 2,200. But a participant retire in 2030 would have contributed approximately $290,000 and we're only looking to receive 1,600 a month. And this is not to include inflation of what it would look like in 2030. Another aspect I would like to highlight is the negative economic impact that that would happen if these plans fell. Our plans were created by collective bargaining agreements with many employers across the country and our localities. If these plans go unsolvent, the unfunded liability of these employers could have them file bankruptcy. This would lead to a large loss of jobs in our area and would also put the burden of our, and it would also place a burden on our manufacturers to find skilled labor to keep their manufacturing plants up and running. Doing nothing could cost the government and taxpayers more. Allowing these plans to go under will take taxpayer, tax paying retirees and turning them into tax burdens. Without these pensions, our members will have no other choice but to seek help through government subsidies. This is not to mention the tax lost by the goods and services that these retirees would no longer be able to afford. I want to stress that the active members wish to hope Congress passes a law that will mitigate the harshest MPRA benefit suspensions. No one wants to see retirees subject to the stress and financial insecurities of this process. But we also need to recognize the enormous sacrifice made by the active members since 2000. For years, the federal government, both executive and Congress, ignored the responsibilities to oversee whether URSA rules it put in place we're working to keep the system healthy. We are now facing a crisis that is significantly worse because of the lack of oversight. Because of its inaction, plans that could have used MRA now cannot and, and, faces, and facing becoming insolvent and having benefits reduced to unlivable levels. These plans have to be addressed now before they fail and possibly take down other plans in their wake. We need a retirement system that'll be there for all workers who are depending on it in their old age one with rules that are flexible enough to keep the plans well-funded and provide a lifetime of benefits with, with real active oversight designing to keep these plans healthy and strong. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Sloan. Thank you for what millwrights do to make Ohio such a leading manufacturing state. Thank you, Mr. Weldon. Welcome. Thanks for the work you're doing. Thank you. Thank you as an order to the committee, especially to those attending today for all allowing us, the retirees, the most vulnerable of all the stakeholders in this pension crisis, to have a voice at the table to explain our position and effects of any possible reductions to our fixed pension income. I want to point out, I would like to say, Senator Portman, I would like to thank you for showing us respect for coming in today, and I also want to let you know that we have respect for you coming in today. And if staff members from the other committee did not show up, if you are here, we respect you for showing up for us today, too. So thank you very much for that. We also have a genuine concern for our fellow active participants and the majority of employers involved. We have a, uh, we, we understand that the active members, the active participants in these funds are our future and we, and we want them to know that we are their future too if we let this go by. That is those employers, especially the employers involved, that is those employers that make their obligated contributions and have a concern for their employees. Unfortunately, there are employers that do not make their 100% contribution as required, which affects the other employers and participants in the fund. One in particular has been claiming they're insolvent for nine years, which their employees have approved concessions to their wages to keep them afloat, while their executives receive stock bonuses, raises, and lucrative retirement income, 
as some of their employees that retired have already been reduced in upwards of 40 to 60 percent. If this crisis is not addressed and solved soon, they will be reduced more, as we all will face. Being the president of the National United Committee to Protect Pensions, a 501c5 nonprofit organization based out of Minnesota, I, along with other committees, or other committees across the nation, have spent time away from our families, sacrificed our time enjoying the things that we retired to do, and endured a level of stress that has affected the lives of many in so many ways since 2013. While we wait in limbo for a solution to the pension crisis, which continually gets con kicked down the road. The end of that road is now in sight. This committee must work together to solve this crisis before it has devastating effects on the national economy and the lives of over one million people currently and growing at a rapid pace. In the words of Secretary, Treasury Secretary Mnuchin, it will become a tsunami. And if you don't believe in the contagion effect, you probably should not be on this committee. When solutions to the pension crisis are discussed, there seems to be a divide as to the word taxpayers. Many times it is told the taxpayers should not bail out the pension woes facing this nation. Let it be known and clear that the National United Committee has never asked for a bailout, though we have watched many bailouts with our paid into tax dollars. We have asked for a solution. We have asked all of the intelligent minds, those with extra expertise, and the bureaucratic departments in government to find or create a solution. Let it be clear that the union workers and retirees are every bit as much a taxpayers as anyone. We watch our tax dollars being spent in many ways that we don't approve. You should realize that while our country is in extreme debt, all the taxpayers bail out our government every day so that those in Congress and their departments and other in our government can still receive their income and pensions. As the majority as the majority of discussion involving a solution to the pension crisis resolves around the reduction of pension income to the retirees, there are many facts that some in Congress, employers, funds, and some unions do not seem to realize. I'll try to point them out, as they all have an effect on the retiree, his family, and the economy. This applies to the current active workers who will retire in the future as well. Being president of the United, National United Committee to Protect Pensions, along with our other committee leaders traveling throughout the country, attending all hearings, invited to congressional briefings and press conferences with many of you on the committee and other Congress members. We have also seen and heard firsthand the stories, the tears, the declining health, the devastation and uncertain future of retirees and active members while attending their retiree meetings and committees. It is something all on this committee should experience, as some of you have, but the rest need to see. These are your constituents that are being put in dire straits, having done nothing wrong and everything right, only to potentially have their dignity and comfortable lifestyle, not rich lifestyle, diminished along with their health. The participants in these pension funds receive a fixed income pension check. Whatever the amount they are awarded when they retire will be that amount during their retirement years with no cost of living, no raises ever. As reductions to retirees' pensions, are always mentioned in the same sentence as solutions. You should be aware that the inflation has already reduced the value of retirees' pension. They cannot absorb more reductions. Thanks to the staff of Senator Portman's office, I received some figures on inflation. So just in the past nine and a half years, according to the official numbers based on the Consumer Price Index for Urban Areas, or the CPI-U, the cost of goods has officially increased. 19% and the value of money has de decreased by 16%. As we all know, many important necess necess necessities has increased by much greater margins, such as in the last nine and a half years, gas has increased 56%, tuition for a four-year college, public college, 51%, and health insurance, 70%. A retiree's pension spends like unemployment compensation. It flows right back into the economy as usually there's not enough to save only to survive. Their fixed income compensation is usually spent in their local and state economy, which includes attractions and entertainment, local, county, and state taxes. As times have changed in America, many support their adult children, have adopted their grandchildren, have disabled family members they care for in their household. The cost of their medication, ordinary home maintenance so their neighborhoods are preserved, the charities and volunteer services they provide to their churches, schools, parks, food banks, and the homeless. 
Many have been putting off remodeling and purchase of vehicles because of the uncertain of their pensions. That is the money that fuels this economy. The majority cannot return to work because of health issues, workplace restrictions, or reemployment restrictions within their pension fund. Many are widows or widowers and do not have a supplemental income. Their loss of the value of their pension because of the inflation will never be recovered because no raise or cost of living. The reduction in their pensions results in lower credit scores, less borrowing power when unexpected expenses rise, such as auto repair, furnace, roof, or other expenses. Bankruptcy and foreclosure will loom. It is already happening to participants in Teamster Local 707 and Iron Workers Local 17. We will not get rich on our pensions. Our pension income goes right back in the economy. And keep in mind, many, many retirees and active workers are veterans. They fought for this country to have freedom, safety, and rights for all. They fought for the American dream, to live the American dream, especially the last years of their lives. We did not risk our lives to watch our dreams and our lives diminish because of no fault of our own. As the active workers is our future, we are the future for their fight in this as well. And to secure that, we earned and was promised the employers are our future as well. The issue of employment withdrawal liability needs to be addressed and revamped. There should be a cap on withdrawal liability if they're going to have it, not to exceed the worth of the company. Possibly in the future, do away with your withdrawal, 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 withdrawal liability in exchange for contracts that stay in or enter a pension fund for a certain length of time. Withdrawal liability is one of the biggest concerns of employers that I have met with. As the issue of loans presented in almost every legislation, the repayment of loans and possible risk pools, we would suggest looking in we, sh we suggest looking into the fines levied on the Wall Street firms from the market crash of 2008. Those fines seem to have totaled in the hundreds of billions of dollars. I think a figure that Political put out was about $320 billion. Other than the mortgage industry receiving $40 billion to recover their losses, no one seems to know where the rest of the money is other than the general fund. As far as repayment or risk pools being questioned, why is there not enough confidence in the new tax reform legislation that is being presented suggesting more businesses coming back to America, more businesses growing, the economy growing, and investments increasing? If all that happens, the funds should increase, the repayment of loans would not be in question, and the pension funds' investment returns would be more than enough to handle the payback. If there is uncertainty in a solution presented, such as the Butch Lewis Act, which has been said to work by top actuary firms, Central States Pension Fund, and United Mine Workers. Instead of looking 30 years down the road from now, try 10 years, the length of time for the congressional budget, and revisit it. All in all, the bottom line is something needs to be done now, not later to save the funds, the people, and the economy. Billions are being lost every day the longer we wait. One way or another, the committee has to work together we have Republicans, Democrats, and Independents in our committees and work very well together. The Joint Select Committee needs to do the same as we are putting our trust in you to create a solution. A solution. Thank you all for your work and consideration you gave us today. Uh, thank you, Mr. Walden. Uh, we'll begin the questioning. Uh, I will question first, then, uh, then uh, Senator Portman and Congressman Neal and, and go down the line. I, I know there's a frustration um, among all of us, and Senator Portman mentioned in his opening statement that um, and so, uh, the, the, the staff here, staff director and my staff director, Gideon Bragan and Chris Allen, on um, Senator Hatch's staff director, are committed to make sure that as soon as we get the numbers, the information on the costs of Butch Lewis, that that, those, that will be shared immediately with every member of this committee. So. Um, you can count on that. Um, my first, first, my, well, the first round, I will ask one question of the six of you. Try to keep it as close to one minute because there are, there are six of you. I, we know there are 1.3 million workers and retirees potentially hurt by this crisis. We know there are thousands of small businesses, as many of you have said. We know it harms the economy. We know that allowing the system to collapse will put taxpayers at risk. So if you can each as, in, in highlight as briefly as you can, um, tell us what it will cost to you or your business or your employees if Congress fails to act. And Mr. Martin, start with you as, as briefly as I apologize for that, as briefly as you can. I think, uh, Senator Brown, it, it just continues this, this uncertainty, this, this black cloud that we've experienced for a long time now. If we don't find a solution, 
you know, as, as, a, as an employer of 550 people, I cannot stand to wait. I have to figure out what I need to do to protect our company and our community from this, this catastrophic event that, that could be coming our way. It, action is so badly needed by this committee. As you've heard all of our members testify here, uh, it has tremendous impact. And it, you asked about cost. It, our pension costs are our highest, fastest growing cost in our company. And there doesn't appear to be any end in sight. And it, it, it's making an impact now on decisions that we make as a company going forward. And, and that's, that's something that 10, 15, 20 years ago didn't happen. It now becomes part of our discussion at the table. Thank you. Ms. Dell. So you're asking me. Make sure your microphones are on as we do this. Just what, what, what is, in, in one minute or so, what is, what is, if we do nothing, what, what happens to you and your, and your fellow men and women and the Teamsters? A lot, a lot of us will go belly up. That's the bottom line. A lot of us, like I said before, live paycheck to paycheck. We, um, I thought I was invincible. I thought I would live forever and I could work forever. I thought that I'd never age, but here I am and retirement is around the corner and I'm not prepared. It was my decisions I made through my life on what I decided to do with my money. And so unfortunately, I'm in this pickle as so many of the, of the other ones that are sitting in here are. Thank you, Ms. Dell. Mr. Gardner. Senator, um, because of increasing pension contributions, our business is in jeopardy. Every day we try to figure out ways to cut costs rather than invest in our business and grow our business. And that's what we would like to do with the money that we are now spending, the increased costs for pensions. Could I add one thing to my talk? Of course. I forgot the third grim statistic that I was supposed to give you all of you and to this group. The third grim statistic is three years ago, our two loans with our banks were called. The reason that they gave us that our loans were called is your unfunded pension liability is too much of a liability and a risk for you and for us. Thank you, Mr. Gardner. Mr. Ward, what's it mean to you and to your members? Chairman Brown, I think it's well known. 80% uh, of our retirees and or widows are from orphan companies. And failure on this part of this committee to do act and act now, our pension fund will go and solve it. One turn down in the market make that happen sooner so if you this committee fails to do what we hold you responsible to do our retirees will be without a pension check in as early as 2022 or before okay thank you mr sloan what's what's it mean to your fellow mill rights for us you know um you guys may not be familiar with what we do but we go all across the United States. We're in every manufacturing plant that makes everything from electricity, the automotives, all the cars that you drive, um, even the beer that you drink. We, we're the people that keeps that up and running, and we work hard to do that. If nothing happens, these people that's worked their whole lives to give you the luxury to do what you enjoy will not have that same lux luxury themselves, myself included. In 2030, I want you to ask yourselves, in 2030, would you want to be able to retire on $1,600 a month? Is that something that you could think is even possible in 2030? So, Mr. Walton. If something isn't done, you, the dignity, in central states alone, 1,000 people a month die. 1,000 people a month. And because of the stress created now, waiting to see what is going to be done, we have people in dire health. Uh, we have people that have uh, passed uh, because of stress, things of that nature. If something isn't done, we lose our dignity. Your neighborhoods go downhill. Our houses go up for foreclosure. Uh, our lives are reduced. We can't enjoy what we retired to do, to spend our last years of our life with our kids and our grandchildren. We can't enjoy a comfortable life. Uh, to uh, be able to purchase vehicles and things of that nature, homes, remodeling, to put back in the economy. In 
many of my friends here today, uh, our lives would just be reduced to nothing. We can't, some of us would be, as it was pointed out by the committee, if something isn't done now, we'll get $100 a month. Why even give us $100 a month? That's ridiculous. Why even have a, a cap of $13,000 $13, a year through the PBGC? Who can live on that? I know pe homeless people that I know are getting more than that, taking donations, getting donations, receiving care at homeless shelters, things of that nature. We can't live on that. We didn't do one thing wrong. We, we waited for Wall, we, you know, we lost money on Wall Street, and in some cases the funds didn't have anything to do with that. They gave that money to investment firms. Those investment firms played with our money. Why aren't we getting some of that fine money back to help us out? But our lives, totally reduced, we would look so embarrassed in our neighborhoods that we have now, the upkeep of our neighborhoods to keep our communities safe, to keep our communities uh, looking nice, like, like we all should. We should enjoy those. We should be fishing today. We shouldn't be sitting here talking about how dire straits will be in if something isn't done very, very soon. Thank very you, Mr. Waldman. Thank you. Senator Portman. I want to go fishing with you sometime, Walden. Let's I didn't go. know you were a fisherman <laughs> until now. Um, thanks for the testimony, everybody. Really uh, heartfelt and sobering, you know. And uh, I'm glad you, Mike, got back into the 90% issue because that's something we got to remember. If we don't do anything, a 90% cut. We also have to remember what Mr. Gardner and Mr. Martin were saying about, you know, what's going to happen to some of the businesses that employ a lot of your active workers. Uh, and Mr. Sloan. One thing I thought was really interesting in your testimony, you, you, know, you gave us some pretty shocking numbers about what's happened in terms of the additional contributions that your uh, brothers and sisters in your trade are having to put in, and yet they're getting less back, about a 20% reduction, uh, you said, uh, over just the last couple of years. The other thing I think sometimes we forget, and again, I'm trying to figure out a way here, how do you get all the people who aren't in this room focused on this issue and paying attention to this issue and understanding it affects them too. Let's say, uh, since I know that you are an apprentice instructor, right? So you know a lot of young men and women who are coming up through the system. Let me ask you this, and uh, it's a leading question, I guess they call it, but don't you find with those people coming in to your trade that they're, they're saying, why should I work for you or this company that's in one of these multi-employer plants, uh, whether it's Southwest Carpenters or whether it's Central States or whether it's mine workers, because I can work somewhere else <laughs> and not have to worry about those lower wages that are necessary because of all this additional cost uh, per worker uh, that have to be paid. because primarily because the system's broken, as Mr. Walden said, well, you know, the orphan system is broken, the withdrawal liability system is broken, it just doesn't work anymore. So let me ask you that. I mean, do you find that when you're talking to some of these folks who are future industrial engineers, do you hear that, that they're not sure they want to work for an employer that's in this system? Yeah, absolutely. In my position, um, I'm asked a lot of hard questions by my apprentices. You know, hey, Brian, what's this happening? How's this going to work? What are we going to do? Um, and, and it's very difficult for me to answer that question. And these people, these men and women, they're in a unique situation. Our, our apprenticeship, what it does is we give a four-year education, just like a college does, at no cost to a taxpayer, at no cost to them. It, it's a free education that allows them to make, you know, sometimes, you know, six digits income. But then they look at the long term, how am I going to retire? So they're in this pickle. Do I maybe stop this and go to college and try to learn this trade but then build up a substantial amount of student loans or do I ride this out and hope that we get it fixed and um, you know th that's what I tell them like you know that's what I'm going to go up there this Friday for I had a whole class this week just pounding me rather than you know actually worrying about what the class is what are you going to do what are you going to ask how are we going to get this fixed and that was the majority of my class so you know they're definitely scared and, you know, to look at their future, they're, they're worried. You know, if this doesn't work, now I'm going to have to worry about student loans. If that doesn't work, you know, how am I going to make that amount of money and still be able to pack, pay those back? At, at least here, I can ride this out and hopefully get a fix 
and still you, be able I, to provide a good. I was thinking about this when, when you were talking to Mr. Ward, you and I have talked a lot about this issue. And as you know, Senator Manchin, I we work, work in a lot of different scenarios. Uh, but one of the uh, objectives is to keep uh, the coal mining business alive. <laughs> yeah. So this is about pensions, but also for Americans who believe that there's a future for a diverse portfolio of energy. Uh, and as you know, I'm a big fan of clean coal technology too, and got some ideas on that that are bipartisan. We can burn some of the coal we have in this country and in this state, but because of this issue, uh, it's it's hard, isn't it? Yes, it is. I mean, it's hard for the companies, but it's also hard for a young man or woman in your community that has been a coal mining community to want to step up and say, I want to get in this business. That's true. The reality today is one employer is paying 85 percent of the contributions into our fund yeah now in the event that that employer something happens where he falls bankruptcy we get a big time problem yeah yep. not only it does but the country does the more coal yeah. fired plants we shut down yeah the the higher costs for all consumers again this is a broader issue than just the people who are so-called you know, directly affected. Yeah. And Mr. Gardner, I was going to ask you about your loans because you didn't mention it in your testimony, and I knew you told me about that story. But this guy can't get loans from the bank. So it's, it's a broader issue. And uh, the other issue you didn't reference uh, in your sobering statement, it was bad enough, but how much do you pay per participant every year to PBGC? Uh, how much do we pay per year to the PBGC? Yeah. I would not know that. Per participant. I do not know that. I think it's about 18000 bucks. Okay. Is that possible? Per employee? It's about 20 years. <laughs> That's the number I have. 18000 bucks to the plan every year. And how much do you pay, Mr. Martin? Do you know? You talk about the PBGC premiums that. How much you pay per employee to the plan? Well, we pay sixty-three hundred dollars a year. Sixty-three hundred dollars a year. Yeah. I think you pay about eighteen. To each plan, uh, we have different amounts that we pay. You got five week. five different plans. Five different plans. I can give you some numbers. Uh, we pay three hundred and thirty-five dollars per week per employee for one plan. We pay about hundred and ninety dollars for another plan. We pay 234 per week per employee for central states. We pay $280 I think, I, I think to that adds up plan. to about 18000 bucks. My, my point is, if you were in a 401k and let's say you decided to do 100% match as a generous plan on, let's say, 6% of income, which would be a generous 401k, what would that number be, do you think? I don't know. A few thousand bucks. Yeah, it would be a third of what we pay now. Yeah. And they yeah. would have something. About 2,300 bucks. So my, my point is this is, a, this is a broader issue that is, as, as again, Mr. Walden said, it's not working. It's not working. And it's going to re result in, for active workers, fewer jobs, lower paychecks, as Roberta said, uh, more pressure. So we've got to figure out how to explain this to people in a way that they understand this is, this is unfair to everybody. And uh, it was never meant to be this way. If we don't fix it, it's going to be even more unfair. Sorry, it took so much time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Congressman Neal, thank you. Thanks very much. And thanks for your uh, really excellent testimony. It couldn't have been any better. And, and what I thought was interesting about the unifying theme of your testimony, nobody said anybody did anything wrong. Nobody said this was about fraud. And what worked at a different period of time doesn't work today because of factors that took place in the marketplace. And every one of you did the right thing. So I would submit this to you. If we don't act on the suggestions that have been made, it's going to take down the PBGC. That is well known. Now, some satisfaction for those of you here today. I've laid out a plan. To my knowledge, it's the only plan that has been put forward so far. And that is that the federal government would backstop the risk on a loan guarantee. We've been able to secure a commitment from Manulife a big life insurance company owns Hancock in Boston, where Manulife with others would purchase the bonds that the United States Treasury Department would sell. Now, I want to thank a fellow that many of you might not know, and that's John Murphy in Boston with the Teamsters. 
He worked with me on this for one solid year. We've sought testimony everywhere from colleagues. And as Mr. Martin noted in his testimony, which I was very, very happy about, the United States Chamber of Commerce has embraced my concept. And they've said, this is what's going to have to be done. Now, retirement is supposed to be a three-legged stool. Some personal savings, a pension, and the bedrock guarantee of Social Security, which incidentally, on average, about $16,000 a year. That's the average Social Security benefit. That's a little bit more than $300 a week. So nobody's getting rich on Social Security. Remember this as well. You can outlive an annuity. You can't outlive Social Security. So what we're going to continue to look at when you measure actuarial realities, in the year 1900, the average male lived to be 46 years old in America. Average. That's, of course, above and below. The average female, just three more years than that. So we are now on the verge of getting close to 80 years old for a male, and a little bit more than that for a female. So our attention has got to be devoted to what retirement savings is going to look like, and not tell people at 63 years old that we're going to change their retirement plan. You can tell somebody who's 23 years old you're going to change their retirement plan because they've got plenty of time to make it up. Today, retirement plans are subject to the vagaries of the stock market, so we all have an interest in growing the American economy. But more and more, it is about the defined contribution rather than being about the defined benefit. But for these plans, they were carefully negotiated, and the two men that are here today that own businesses, you laid out the reality of where we find ourselves. And for those of you who submitted at an earlier stage of life to take a reduced salary because you knew you would take that benefit early, later on in life, that's just the reality of what happened. So the loan plan that I've laid out, I've worked with the administration, I've talked to them about it, and to my knowledge at the moment, it is the only plan that anybody's talking about. And so I, I hope that uh, we'll have a chance for you to embrace that plan or a variation thereof. And Senator Portman did say, we've known each other for a long, long period of time, I've spent a career working on retirement issues. And this is going to be a catastrophe if we don't straighten out the multi-employer pension plans here. So I want to ask Mr. Martin if you would carefully explain for us, because your testimony was very good, Tell us about the last man standing rule, because that's what we're up against today here. Uh, sure, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, the last man standing rule, uh, you know, we entered the Central States Pension Plan in 1972 through our bargaining agreement with the Teamsters Local 20. And at that point, there was no discussion of employer withdrawal liability or us taking the responsibility for the pension obligations of employers that fail. Whether that's through bankruptcy or just shutting down, whatever the reason, employers have been allowed to exit these plans stage right, and we are successful employers. We've been in business for 112 years, and we hope to stay in business much longer than that. And we're, we're standing here now with, with different folks telling me, and I get different answers from different attorneys and different people, yeah, you keep staying in this plan, you could be the last man standing. What does that mean? It means if there's no one else to cover all the benefits of people whose companies have failed, it's going to fall on us. And we can't shoulder that burden. There's no way we can cover 400,000 people in the central states plan. It's impossible for a small business. And it's not just our small business. There's 1,300 other small businesses in central states that could be asked to shoulder that. It's not, not feasible. It can't work. So the dilemma that you've outlined was not created by unnecessary or undue risk, was it? You weren't out at, in Las Vegas saying, how could I improve the retirement plan for my employees? You were doing what you were supposed to do. Correct. Along the way. We'd never have missed a payment to Central State's pension fund. That's exactly the point that I'm trying to drive home, that the intentions that were undertaken by the witnesses here today were entirely honorable. And they were based on a series of suggested guarantees. But changes in the marketplace, not based on fraud, not based on unnecessary risk taking, changed. So close on this note. I've been in Congress for a long time. And I wasn't there to create the SNL problem. 
but I was there for the solution. The SNLs were a bailout. Wall Street was a bailout. What my legislation does is not a bailout. And that's really important to point out. It is a loan that will have to be paid back. But we've also laid out a manner and shape in which you can do it. And I hope that by the end of the year, when our recommendations are due, that we're going to take into consideration the exceptional testimony that you all offered here today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Congressman Neal. Senator Manchin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> and thank all of you uh, for being here, because it makes a difference. It made a difference in Washington. It makes a difference when we hear from you. Uh, I, I, I come from a coal mining uh, community. I raised in a little coal mining town, Farmington. We had 400 people, and we had eight largest mines in the world. And it was just unbelievable, the quality of work that people did. Well, 1946, uh, this uh, pension and health care was uh, at that time guaranteed by the federal government through the Krug-Lewis uh, uh, Act. And these people have worked under that premise every time a coal that was mine would go into a retirement pension plan. Every, every, uh, every uh, contract they've had in the UMWA, and usually back in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, up to the 70s, and even early 80s, most anyone who mined coal was a member of the UMWA. Things did change. Uh, we're dealing with something now. We have what we call an AML fund, Abandoned Mine Land Fund. And that fund there, we have, I had a piece of legislation, which I have co-sponsors all sitting here with me in the Senate, uh, both uh, Sherrod and, and Rob. And this piece of legislation was the Miners Protection Act. That legislation did not ask for a bailout, did not ask for a loan. We were able to take care of that, but because of politics, that thing was split. The baby was split in two. We got to miners' health care. If we'd have had this fixed at that time, we wouldn't be sitting here. We'd be sitting here helping everybody else. But it didn't get done because of the toxicity that we live in in Washington, D.C. Now we're sitting here facing needed almost $4 billion in loans just for the miners, and it's growing exponentially. So we've got to do something. Um, I've got, uh, here's the other thing about that. Most of, uh, most of my miners' pensions are going to widows. Their husbands have passed on. And the average pension is $582. Think about that. I know we've talked about $1,600, and you've talked $582. Think what that does to them. This is what we're dealing with. I mean, we're going to destroy people's lives, and we're just not going to sit here and let it happen. I'm going to ask you all a few questions because I need to get your temperament. I need to know where your, where your minds are right now because you're going to have to pull all of us together. You're going to have to pull us together as Americans. Forget about being a Democrat and Republican. You know, we're on the same team here. We've got to figure this one out. This one could take us down quicker and faster and harder than anything that's faced the United States since the Great Depression. I truly believe that. And I see, it, I see this train wreck coming. I, so I see the light in the tunnel, and it is sure as hell not the daylight on the other side. It's the train coming right at us. So here's what I would ask you. Do you believe the pension disaster that we're facing was caused by politics? And we'll go down the line. Do you believe it was caused by politics or just by the market? I will address some of that. <laughs> we'll start here then, Mr. Wall. What do you, well, just real quick, do you, do you think it was? Yes. Okay. Uh, our pension. So Democrats and Republicans both to blame? Yes. Uh, or if you. A couple things concern me about the, the question you asked. I've got a couple more, so I'm going to ask if I can <laughs> as quickly as possible, because I've got to, I got to, get, a, I got to get a feeling where you are. But you believe it, it, it politics played a part in this? Uh, yes. Okay. Mr. Sloan? Yes, I do. If you're talking about finding a solution, absolutely it did. I mean, to cause the problem that we're facing. Well, that's true, yes. Okay. Mr. Gardner? I would say no. Okay. Ms. Dell? Myself, I don't like to point fingers at anybody or any, anything. And so, on that note... You don't think it was a political problem? I think it was everything all mixed together. I got you. Mr. Martin. I would say partially. You know, there have been so many, uh, there have been so many attempts to fix pension problems. Uh, well, I could sit here and talk about bankruptcy laws and everything else that kind of contributed to it. My goodness, we let people walk away from their obligations and ever since, who's left holding the bag? Those of you last man standings Correct. holding the bag. Absolutely. Correct. So those were political decisions that were made in the 80s. And so, but here it's about a 50-50. So let me, let me ask this. Do you believe that your union or your company is responsible for the possible loss of your pension. 
Do you blame it on your union or your business decisions or people that came before you? I'll start with you, Mr. Martin. No, I don't blame this on the Teamsters Union. Okay. I don't blame this on Spangler Candy. And that's what, that's what Rich has said. Right. Okay, we're seeing the same. But I just got to get a temperament here. Ms. No. You're not blaming on your unions? No. That you're not blaming yourself for not putting more in or you've already put enough in? This, so you're not hearing that? That's not it? No. Okay. Mr. Gardner? Senator, I would say that we have a bar bipartisan effort every day in our company between the union people and the management to succeed every day. Gotcha. No. I would say um, through my research, the, the largest reason that I, I see this is legislation that allowed the unions not to mess with the pension plans. Um, so they were kind of forced in a way to be bet blame. That makes sense. Yep. I personally believe there was possibly a little bit of fault on each Both sides. side of the fence. Okay. But uh, uh, I think one major uh, issue was wasn't that long ago I believe in the 90s every pension fund in this country had billions of dollars in excess everything that you all have said is everything that rich evaluated here because he was saying no one's sitting here responsible no one's blaming anybody everybody wants to fix so I think I would ask this final question here we are representing the, the federal government Rep we're, we're, we work for you do you believe that the government, federal government, should be involved in helping to fix the challenges that we have. And we're not talking about bailouts. We're talking about absolutely a commitment and a loan, believing in the people of America. Now, I'm, I'm asking from business to labor. Yes. Business, yes. Um, yes. 100% yes. Business, labor, business, since labor. Since 1946, the federal government has found a way to fix the mine workers problem until now and we so had yes. a way we still have a way to fix that one yes. but we're trying to help all of our brothers and all the working people okay i got you that's Mr. the solution we're absolutely looking for i feel the same that solution so this is not political you're basically thinking that democrats and republicans we got to fix this thing and here we're setting as democrats and republicans and you're asking for a loan program you're not asking for a ballot and change some of the regulations got you Thank you, Senator Manchin. Congressman Scott, welcome. Um, Mr. Chairman, do you anticipate a second round? Uh, yes, I, it, some may have to get to the airport. I will certainly stay a second round. And I, Richie has to go. Do you have, and he won't be here for a second round. Do you have additional questions? No, 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 okay. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I thank you and uh, Senator Portman and the others for being here today. This is a very important hearing. This is the first time that the Select committee has actually heard from workers and retirees whose pensions are in jeopardy, and these pensions are in jeopardy through no fault of their own. Uh, Mr. Sloan has pointed out that um, uh, his pension was in good shape in 1998, and he wanted the opportunity to s set up a rainy day fund to keep from ha this from happening, but was prevented by um, congressional action from, from, from doing that. We've heard from our witnesses, hardworking Americans who are at the risk of losing about everything. And we've heard about the contagion effect, the solvency of local businesses. That solvency hangs in the balance because of the multi-employer crisis. And the federal government has a significant interest. Uh, lower tax revenues from those who aren't getting pensions, lower tax revenues from businesses that go out of business, increased safety net and social, uh, safety net social services that have to be paid federal government has a significant interest in fixing this. And what is abundantly clear is that all of the witnesses, everybody here, and in fact, everybody outside of the rally, they're all counting on this committee to come up with a, a solution. Uh, let me begin with um, uh, Mr. Sloan again. Did, did you, um, uh, you, you indicated your pension was in good shape in 98. Did you do anything to create this problem? Well, 1998, I was in still high school, sir. Okay, um, well, the... <laughs> <laughs> but um, as far as the union members are concerned, um, I, I'm very active in this specific scenario. And uh, the union members by no means did anything to put them in the situation. From, from 98 to 2000, the millwright carpenters in this area were booming. 
I mean, it, it wasn't, you know, get done with one project and wait around for another one. You got done with one, and you had five other employers begging you to come to work. But, but this, was, this, was, this wasn't your, as Richie said, this isn't your, your cause. Absolutely not, now, no, sir. Um, the cause was really the stock market collapse in uh, 2008, which a lot of uh, pensions were in good shape up to that point. And that collapse didn't cause, wouldn't cause by accident. It was caused by the greed, mismanagement, and, and some actual criminal activity on behalf of uh, Wall Street. Um, the best of my knowledge, virtually no one has been punished for this. In fact, isn't it true that they got bailed out? That's absolutely true. So the perpetrators got bailed out. You think um, maybe the victims ought to get a little assistance? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I thought so, too. Um, Mr. Martin and Mr. Gardner, you both uh, kind of alluded to the operation. Your, your business operations are in jeopardy because of this. And uh, Mr. Gardner, can you mentioned the uh, loans. Can you uh, say what effect the um, challenge of having to put your potential liability on your financial statement uh, has on your ability to operate and get routine business loans? When you have to get new loans, it costs you more money because of attorney fees, because of uh, higher interest rates, et cetera. And Mr. Martin, have you had uh, problems getting uh, business loans because yeah. of this potential liability? We have not yet had those issues. Uh, but we're, we fear that it's coming. If we don't solve this, so, this problem, banks are going to become more and more aware as employers begin to fail that this is a real crisis and they will make it very difficult uh, for us to get credit. So when they talk about the, program, the plan going broke in 2025, um, it's actually a more immediate problem than that because this problem is affecting your businesses as we speak, is that right? That's correct. Most loans are five to ten years long. So if a bank is looking at your credit and he's looking at all potential uh, liabilities and business issues with your company, we're now in that window where a bank will see that, oh, you've got, you're in central states, it's projected to fail in 2025. The executive director has stated when it's going to fail, June of 2025. That will affect their decision to extend us credit, yes. Mr. Chairman, I have 14 seconds left. I'll wait to the second round. Uh, you, have, you have more than that <laughs> since you flew in. Take, you, got, you have another question? Okay. Welcome. Thank you, Chairman. It's good to be in Ohio. Uh, having spent uh, 38 years in a multi-employer plan, I understand at a level that uh, many of our witnesses who are giving testimony, and we want to thank you for bringing the actual, the truth. But it's the hard truth, and certainly, uh, Mr. Wallen, it's great to see you here again, and uh, you, for your advocacy for the men and the women that I see up above and the ones outside. Thank you. you know, sometimes it's certainly I felt that way that Washington didn't hear us. So that's one reason I'm here, and certainly my colleagues are here. But people like you, who bring the real stories back to us. Um, and this is a national emergency, and that's not overstated in any way. You know, the employers involved. Without the employer, there would be no employees. There would be nothing to have a retirement from. Certainly, the employees, our next generation are going in today. You know, how do you explain to them putting this amount of money aside for the little bit they get out, for what you have to do each and every day, and quite frankly, each year, is nothing short of remarkable. Uh, and if it wasn't for that solidarity that unions carry, it wouldn't happen. And uh, then we look at the retirees who did everything right. They deferred their dreams. That little bit of dream each week that you have taken your kids to the ice cream store or sent them on a summer camp, you deferred that so at your golden age you can enjoy it with dignity. And certainly the pension trustees who have to make those tough decisions. And I have to just echo what uh, Richie Neal was talking about in terms of whose fault it is. Listen, we've had the last three meetings hearing the reasons that we are here today, and it's like blaming a hurricane on a member here. Hurricanes came in, unpredictable, wiped out Florida, wiped out Texas, 
but for some reason, we don't blink an eye when it's time to help them. Nor should we. That's our obligation to help those. Why well, look at this as a hurricane that has hit the pension plan? The difference is you give the money to those states who've been impacted, they're not expected to pay it back. The plan that Richie has put forth gives you a roadmap to help you out when you need it and you're gonna pay it back. Or as he says, backstop it. So that contingent effect is so real and the cost of doing nothing here is that vortex that will literally suck down first those who are in the pensions but then you're gonna break down the belief that Americans have that you can put money aside for those golden years and it's going to be there. That's gonna be in question. That literally is gonna be in every American's mind when they go to put aside. You know, yesterday it was a defined benefit and there are some healthy plans there. But tomorrow we see more and more it's that defined contribution that you now are your investor. You have to make those big money decisions. So. The question that we have in this national emergency, and again, Rich Neal talking about whose fault it is. And I look at the front line, those who have to put together enough capital to open up a business. You talked about that you're within the 10 year window, and that could fluctuate depending on the market as we get here. But the value of your company, Reinvesting in the companies, no matter which side of the ledger you're on, if you're on the union, the labor side, or the management side, believes that a healthy company is good for all. The value of your company, if you were to try to sell it, tell me where that goes. That would be a difficult uh, situation for us. If we, our, our company is not for sale, we want to remain independent forever. But if it were, this would be a significant issue in the negotiations. It could probably stop a sale. So if somebody wanted to come in and make that huge investment, and as many companies do, and that's the same effect that you would get when you try to have access for capital. If you want to put in a new line to make more dum-dums, is that what they're called? Yes. Yeah, right. yeah. What do you If you mean want to put in another, another line of dum-dums, you either self-fund that or you're not going to get that capital. We're now within that window of you know a seven to ten year loan. You know seven years is 2025. So we're within that window. It could be an issue. Mr. Gardner, what would you have to do? They called in your loans, correct? Were you able to satisfy that? Uh, we were able to get another loan from another bank. How did they address the issue of the unfunded liability? Because I'm going to guess the time you took it out and the time now it's changed considerably. Yes, our unfunded liability has uh, gone up, but our new bank has confidence in us to move forward. Well, that speaks volumes about how you run your business and to those. But I look at my brothers and sisters and the mine workers, 500 bucks a month. How do you live? How do you do that? The dignity of working all those years in the mines and then somehow you pull together. Because you're talking 500. The most that anybody could get in the event that central state was to go under is that $12,870. $12,870. And then, as we know, the PBGC goes and collapses from there. So the cost of doing nothing here, we hear you loud and clear, and it certainly is our obligation, as we have been trying to work across the aisle, because this is the hurricane effect hitting the pension. I yield back. Thank you. Thank you, Congressman. Congresswoman Dingle, welcome from the state up north. Nice to see you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's great to be here um, in Ohio. I am from Dearborn, Michigan, and uh, 364 days a year, we're all close friends, and the Saturday after Thanksgiving, we're bid whichever city I'm in, we uh, fight hard. Um, and I see people in this room from Michigan uh, who have been talking to me for a long time. I also, because nobody else did it, maybe it's a girl thing. The bill that um, Mr. Neal has sponsored, which is in the House, and Ms. Senator Brown has in the Senate, is known as the Butch Lewis Bill, and I see Rita, his wonderful spouse, who's become a good friend in the audience, and it's good to see you. You both have worked hard. And he's sitting next to um, 
the eyes and ears of the senator from um, Michigan. I have sort of been a spouse and I'm a member and I know how lucky you are both, everybody at this table to have spouses that are in the community and listening and understanding. So it's good to see you. But I was, I did 10 town halls last week and I know Dennis is in the audience and I heard very tragic story. I mean, it was, it was really upsetting. I had one man, I had two Teamsters who came, and I think one of them came with the other because um, he was suicidal at this point. He didn't know what to do. I was with uh, two of my local union presidents at a meeting that had been organized, and a man came up to me and said, my wife is dying. What do I tell her? And I, Greg Nowak, who was the president there, was with me, and I said, do you have insurance? And he said he did, and I said, then take care of her and let us fight for you. You need to be with her right now. And another family came up with eight kids, or eight people. It wasn't eight people. It was several generations in the home, mother, opioid addict, but didn't know how they were going to feed people. And so what I think you've all done today is to also help put the human face on this. And people don't understand that these are people, as everybody here has established, they play by the rules, they worked their lifetime, they worked hard, they worked overtime, and they didn't take pay raises because they thought they'd have the safe and secure retirement. And it's not there. So I'm going to ask all six of you one question, and then I really want to also talk about the economic impact in the communities. But would all of you quickly maybe comment about what's the impact of the stress and the uncertainty of not knowing what your future benefit level is going to be and how it's impacting your everyday life for your business? Why don't we start at this end, Mike? Well, as far as my future goes, and I think I speak for many, uh, we want to do things. We want to put money back in the economy. Uh, we would like to. That is what fuels the economy. Uh, but we don't know what to do. We don't know whether to spend our money, save our money, uh, where we go. We don't, we don't know if we're going to have food next month or uh, if we can eat all we have right now. And it's devastating. It's, in my case, I'm a single person. I don't have a supplemental income coming from a spouse that still works or is going to be retired. So I have to be very, very careful with what I do. The widows and widowers have the same uh, issue. They, they, have, they get uh, very little of what their husbands or wives uh, contributed to the pension fund or what their pension was. And it's just, uh, it's just totally stressful. It, it's taking a toll. Personal tolls. A personal toll. Healthcare tolls. I have a passion to fight this. I care about the employers, the active workers, and retirees. I have a passion. I know, Mike. And I, I, I can't just want to come hug you, all of you. I do know. I can't tell you how many stories I've listened to and how many times I've sat down and cried because it's so overwhelming. It's why are we going through this? Sometimes we look at the food chain, we always start at the top. Let's look at the bottom of the food chain. We can. He, That's why we're here today. This Mr. hearing is yes. doing that. Mr. I respect Mr. Martin to the utmost, but he can make, he makes 12 million dum-dums a day. Those dum-dums, if nobody is down there at the bottom to buy them and eat them, his business is out of business. And that money that fuels these employers the, to, to be able to hire active workers and keep it going, if we down here right now, and especially the middle class, don't buy those dum-dums or those loaves of bread that David Gardner and his company are making, those employers and those active workers have nothing. And it's going to have a devastating effect, and that's part of the contagion effect. But the passion for this, the times I sit down, it just weep because of what's going on. Why did I fight for this country? Why did my fellow veterans fight for this country? Why do we have to go through this? You know, there's a lot of reasons, but let's settle it. Let's settle what is happening right now today for the people that earned it today. 
But I also agree we have to look into the future for the baby born today and for the active worker that just started her jobs today. You have to come up with something. You have to help those people. 401ks, listen to the Ways and Means Committee of September 14. At Pat T. Berry was the subcommittee chairman and everybody on that committee agreed after that hearing that 401ks are not the answer. Concessions given to employers are not the answer. It only digs you a deeper hole. The, the PBGC is so discriminatory with, between the single employer plan and the multi-employer plan. Those things need fixed. But right now, we need the critical and declining plans fixed now. Not next year, not 10 years from now. You can work on something in the future. But don't put us through this stress. This is the last years of our lives. My kids, when, my grandkids, when I started this, some of them were just born. They're five and six years old now. I haven't seen them nowhere, no, nowhere near the amount of time that I would like to spend with them and see them. And kids need their grandparents today. They need their grandparents to, to, to guide them in what used to be and how it used to be. Thanks. We have to fix this. Thank you. It's important what you're saying. Let's go down the row, Mr. Son, and then because I'm only going to get one question because this is so hard for all of you, maybe some of you can talk about how you're not making some investments if that's the case because of some of this liability. Mr. Sloan. Uh, for myself, my, my wife always wanted to be a stay-at-home mom. Uh, she was not a woman who wanted to go to work. She wanted to raise her kids. So I I agreed, you know, that's what we're going to do. So I sacrificed my time with my children as a millwright. I've traveled in almost every state to work um, away from my family. But with this upcoming, you know, crisis that we're seeing, my wife's decided to go to work because, you know, now we're going to use her money to kind of put back an extra savings plan because, you know, we're uncertain. Are we going to have that, that pension that, you know, I was promised when I started this? And then on top of that, it added more burden to us because now we're trying to find, you know, babysitters or somebody to watch our children. So, you know, it's a compounding effect on a personal level. Thanks. Mr. Ward. Since 1946, our government promised mine workers cradle to grave health care and a retirement pension when they retire. Have all of you have heard that those pension amounts are not a great deal of money. <laughs> so we're not talking about people that's got three or four thousand dollars that we're we're going to cut off of them. We're talking about people that's got five hundred or less, which they use to pay their bills or buy medicine with. And on top of that, we constantly hear, well, we gotta cut Social Security. Now Social Security and that pension allows these people to live. Failure on your part to do something to fix it will not. But that's simple. They won't be able to buy medicine. They won't be able to pay their bills. Somewhere along the line, and I think all of you here recognize it, there's got to be a fix for everybody here talking. There's got to be a fix for each one of us. And I think you've got the ability to do that. You've proved it in the past, and I think you can do it again. Thank you. Mr. Gardner. Congresswoman, all companies with loans have covenants. When you have covenants, your capital expenditures are restricted. When we are paying $5.7 million more per year for pension benefits, we can't invest in new products, new equipment, nor ways to grow our business to employ more people. Thank you. Ms. Dell? When my husband and I had filled out our wills, I was in pretty good health. Right now, I sit here with an aneurysm, not knowing from day to day whether I'll be sitting up again. And so with that, I worry about being a burden to my children financially because are they going to be able to take care of me? I don't want them to have to ha go through that. I wish I could move into a one-story house 
but I don't know if I could ever do that because of the fact I don't have an idea if I would even have the income to help pay for that. Um, I would love to travel. I've put all that on hold. I even have a, what's in my folder here on the outside. I've wrote the word travel, and I had my ideas in there, and they're all out now because I don't want to take that money that I am getting now from working to spend it that way. I'm trying to save every penny I can to prepare myself what little I can. Um, medical coverage is a big worry, as it is with so many others. Um, we just need you guys so desperately. I know. Mr. Martin. Thank you. I'd like to quote from the U.S. Chamber of Commerce report on June 13th, 2018, Businesses and Jobs at Risk. That's just one sentence. It is likely that plan insolvency will lead to employers going out of business, filing for bankruptcy, or both. It's just a matter of time. I'll tell you that if that happens, there'll be no investment. There'll be no investment in our community, which desperately needs it. And I want to talk about our employees for just one second. I have employees come in my office every week. They know that Roberta and I are actively involved in this effort. They're very concerned. They're very emotional. They have tears in their eyes. And I just look at them, and they think this is about retirement, and it is. But they don't understand it's about way more than that. This is about their job. This is about their wages. This is about their health care. This is about their savings. Because if we're not there to provide it, all those things go away. I understand their concern about their retirement. But in a bigger picture, if the whole system goes under, so do we. And all those other things go away, too. And that is, that's catastrophic. In our small community, they can't run out and just grab a job. It's catastrophic. Thank you for, for working on this problem for us. Thank you, all of you. Back. Thank you, Congressman Dingle. I think what Mr. Martin just said, it's way more than retirement. It's about employment, about their jobs. And what you and Ms. Dell have done as a team is, is inspiring to us. So thank you. Uh, we will do a second, much quicker round. I will um, start, but I will keep it within five. I'm glad everybody went over because they flew in and they didn't have a chance to speak, as Senator Portman and I did. But we will keep these to five minutes this second round. Um, I will start and set an example to keep it to five minutes. So um, thank you. I, I'm following up on what Mr. Martin said from the Chamber of Commerce report. Uh, Ms. Alia Wong. Um, came and spoke to us from the uh, executive director of retirement policy at the U.S. Chamber, uh, and she said in her in her testimony the risks to businesses include employers not only in declining plans but also in healthy plans. The job risks impact not only union employees but non-union employees too. Moreover, this isn't a future crisis; it's a current crisis. Employees and workers are being impacted today. Only it will only get worse. As a number of people have said here, it will only get worse the longer we wait. So my, my question is to the two employers here, to Mr. Martin and Mr. Gardner. Uh, you face the threat of retirement, of withdrawal liability that in many cases is larger than the value of the entire businesses. Some uh, business, some of, more than 200 small Ohio businesses are part of the central, Ohio, central states plan. We know that many of these businesses have come to talk to Rob and to me in private about the fears that you have but you can't really share in public because it would alarm creditors, it would alarm employers, employ, I'm sorry, employees, and it would alarm business partners, it might it would alarm the alarm the banks. So as much as you can say, Mr. Martin, Mr. Gardner, speak on their behalf and explain the impact withdrawal liability has on small business and, and what will happen if nothing is done. And each take a couple of minutes so we can stay close to the five minutes, Mr. Martin. Sure, if you don't mind, I'll go first, David. The, the 204 employers that you speak of in Ohio, I have spoken personally to at least 20 of them, almost 10%. Most of them have revenues in the range of 2 to $4 million a year, and they're looking at withdrawal liabilities that are in the 4 to $5 million. So it's even more than the revenues that their businesses generate. Most of their businesses were handed down to them from family members, it, at that time, no one realized how serious the crisis was. So a lot of these business owners inherited, they paid for the business, inherited the business, and now they've inherited this huge withdrawal liability 
they can't add employees because of what I said before. It t adds another $200,000 to the liability. They can't sell their companies because who wants to take on the liability? And, and they can't shrink because it'll trigger withdrawal liability. So they're stuck. And it's a serious issue, and they have really no way to go, nowhere to go. And, and, and I think it's, it's something Ohio's ground zero, and that's why I really appreciate you, Senator Brown, and Senator Portman taking real leadership on this issue. Ohio is ground zero for this problem. Thank you, Mr. Gardner, please. Senator Thank Brown, um, I would like to um, talk about my role as the chairman of the Long Company. The Long Company is a group of, it's a cooperative of independent and some national bakeries all over the United States. So not only is this problem a Nichols Bakery problem, it's a problem and a crisis for every family-owned bakery in Ohio. And there are many of these. There are family-owned bakeries that operate in Cleveland, in Cincinnati, in, uh, there's a family-owned bakery in Sydney, Ohio, in Youngstown. And uh, I have the presidents of these bakeries calling me and saying, what do we do? and we need your help. That's why I'm here. I'm also representing these bakeries in the Long Co-op to try to send the message to you to work together to help us. Thank you. That's very helpful from both of you. Thank you, Senator Portman. You know, in the interest of uh, just getting more information out there and broadening the scope of this thing, um, and uh, Mr. Walden, Mike, I might, I might ask you to comment on this because I know you're familiar with it. One thing I think a lot of people don't recognize is the number of people in healthy plans that would be affected. Uh, they don't recognize the impact, as Mr. Martin and Mr. Gardner just talked about, about whole communities being impacted. Think of Bryan, Ohio, without Spangler, God forbid. Um, by the way, my family first came to Ohio, to Bar, Ohio, as Swiss immigrants. Um, they must have known the Nichols. Um, they, they worked on a dairy farm, but that community, it's a tiny community, small community, mm -hmm. totally dependent on you guys. Um, so you talked about the payments you make every year, the 6,300, and I think yours is more than that. Mm -hmm. I suggested 18,000. Maybe I shouldn't have said that, but mm -hmm. I think that's what it is to your five, five plans. More than half of that probably goes for workers that are not your workers, right? That's what central states tells us, yes. Yeah, that's your point earlier about the orphan issue. Orphans meaning someone gets orphaned because their company goes out of business, but they're still in the plan, and so the other companies and workers have to pick up the tab. And so it's, it just doesn't seem fair, does it? But Mike, what I want to ask you about is the other insolvent plans, because there are 72 plans in the country that are insolvent, 93,000 participants, and they are getting the, the minimum guarantee from PBGC for the most part. And uh, that's the $12,870 figure we heard earlier. Now, if we don't do anything, what's going to happen is Central States, Mine Workers Plan, Southwest Carpenters Plan are going to go insolvent. And in fact, Mr. Ward, you have made the good point that for the mine workers, which is the 582 bucks a month, that's probably going to go under 2022, 2023 time frame, not 2025, yeah. even sooner. But when that goes under, and then PBGC goes under, and I'm told by the experts, and we've had two hearings on this, that if even one of those plans goes under, it's likely PBGC goes under. Then those workers in the insolvent plans aren't going to get the minimum guarantee anymore, are they? No, definitely not. So they're also going to get cut. Now, yes. it, it won't be 90% because they're already at the minimum, but it'll be <laughs> down to this minimum amount that would be the equivalent of the 90% cut that the Teamsters are going to get. Maybe you talk about that for a second, Mr. Walden, because you've got a lot of brothers and sisters out there who are looking at you to help protect them who are not in this room today because they're already in insolvent plans that are going to get hurt even worse if we don't figure this out for central states. Well, that's, that's very true. This isn't just a central states problem, though it is the biggest problem. But as, as we talk about the contagion effect, 
it's going to affect employers, everyone, I, even a large company like UPS. They, they're looking into possible bankruptcy if something isn't done, uh, you know, meeting with them because they are the next biggest plan in the Central States Western Conference. They are the biggest employer in Western Conference. As far as the insolvent plans, I don't know what those people are going to do because we're, as I mentioned earlier, we have a company, YRC, that has already reduced people's, uh, you know, the participants' pensions that retired after uh, September 24th of 2010, that if they retired, they already had their pensions reduced 50, 40 to 60, 70 percent. Now they're looking at more cuts if something isn't done to central states. That is an employer problem. And it is not a, a fun problem, so to speak. It, it's ridiculous to, to me claim nine years of going out of business, uh, that they don't have money, they're insolvent, allowing them to only contribute 25 percent, but allowing them to give bonuses, raises in excess of tens of millions of dollars a, a year, and not contributing. We signed an MOU contract back in 2008, 2009, that we thought we were signing a, uh, uh, it was called a Memorandum of Understanding, but it was going to be somewhat of a, in that contract, I can't remember the exact language, but they would not be able to give raises and things of that nature unless we were made whole. But I, our I, people, my, my time is coming to a close here. I'm, I'm sorry. going to try to respect the, the chairman's five minutes. <laughs> Let me just say two other issues quickly, and I want to ask you to respond. I know how you feel about it, but retirees ought to be on the boards of these pension plans, in my view, and people ought to have their vote counted. The Pension Accountability Act, you know, says that, and there was a recent plan, Mr. Stone, your plan's uh, in front of Treasury right now. There was a recent plan that the plan got accepted for cuts because a lot of people didn't vote and their vote was automatically counted as a yes. That's not democracy in my no, view. So it's not I what I fought for in Vietnam. Going forward, how do we do all this? Part of it is these governance changes that uh, we can get more transparency and democracy into these plans. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Foreman. Uh, Senator Manchin. Very quickly, I, I'm so sorry I went over the form. I'm not going to go over this time. Uh, again, you know, you all have been eloquent as far as bringing a face and, and real people's lives to, to what we're dealing with, whether it's from the business arena, whether it's from the workers arena. Uh, we're all in this together. Um, the biggest problem that I see is the bankruptcy laws. This is going to repeat itself. We're going to fix the problem today. We're not going to fix it for the future generations unless we fix the bankruptcy laws. Until people understand or the courts understand that a human being has, should have as much placement as far as in the priority list uh, when it comes to dissolving a company or bankrupting a company than the financial institutions. And they're saying, well, if you do that, then the banks won't loan the money. The market will adjust itself, but the human being can't be, we can't be denigrated down to the point where we're non-existent. This doesn't mean anything. We, there's nothing left. When the bankruptcy laws get done with what they get done with and the courts get done with what they get, when do you ever see a pension plan being considered in bankruptcy? I've never seen it. It's never been done. And yet we're sitting here talking. We need a major fix. We really do. You all have fought the good fight in your businesses, family-owned businesses. You're fighting a good fight. You're caught between a rock and a hard place. Probably don't have anybody knocking, beating down your door wanting to buy. And on the other hand, you can't expand to really compete in the market area the way you want to compete. I got it. I've been in business all my life and small and all different types. But we have got to fix this. Only thing I can say to you, unless your voice is heard, unless you're basically saying, we need the federal government to step up because if not, this could be the greatest financial crisis we face in our lifetime. And I mean it. This doesn't affect your business or, Mr. Ward, you know, our pensions that we have for our dear minors and our widows and all that. And Ms. Dell and, and yours who are looking forward to how do you, how do you survive after work. Uh, it goes right down the line. And there's nobody going to be unscathed. So uh, have you spoken to your representatives? I would ask all of you. Are you getting favorable response from your Democrats and Republicans, or are you getting no committal or non-committal? Because you two, you are involved, and 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 I'm not going to ask you to name who you're. You know, I'm not going to embarrass anybody that way. But I want you to think, think of where you are as a business person or individuals relying on a pension right now. What type of response are you receiving from us? Are are we trying to help? Are we looking for an answer or we're saying we're working on this? Are you getting any commitment at all? Someone has got to speak to it. In, in the case of senators, 
You're looking at mine, so yes. <laughs> Same here. <laughs> well, and I'm in here. You're, you're, you're involved in a nationwide with all the bakers or nation, right? Sir, Sir Mitchell, we don't allow West Virginia witnesses, so that's why you got that answer. <laughs> I, got a lot of West, well, I got a lot of West Virginians out here somewhere. They're, they're here. Uh, Camo. <laughs> Camo. But anyway, yes, sir. Senator, I went to Washington with eight other family business owners, and I thought we had a great response meeting with seven Congress more or the legislative assistance for these Congress. Let me be more specific to you. Do you know how many of us are on this committee? There's only 16 of us out of 535. Right. Correct? Right. You don't have to go to everybody. Just go to us 16 first. Okay. Just go to us 16. Put the hammer on us. Okay. And I mean from the business and the labor. Put the hammer on us. Give us, because we're going we're gonna to fool around. We're going to get to November and say, well, we've tried everything. It's just falling apart. I can see it coming. Yes, sir. One other thing. Um, I've been employed for 47 years full time. I started working in 1967 as a part timer. And this is the greatest crisis facing our family owned business in its 109 year history. Well, and the Chamber of Commerce is agreeing that there should be a loan program. We don't have a chamber which represents most of the small businesses. And as a small business, you understand, I was, I'm, I wrote all my checks. I never cashed them all, but as a business person, I wrote them. And if a small business understands that, you, you're the last one to be paid. So I'm, I'm saying there's 16 of us, and it's not hard to get who we are and where we represent and, and, and get to all of us. I'm telling you, we need your help. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Senator Manchin. Congressman Scott. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Chairman, first, we had a lot of different numbers about what's actually going into the PBGC and what's going into the pension funds. I'd like to ask the two employers if you could provide for the record what you're paying into the PBGC per employee and what you're putting into the pension funds per employee and how much they expect to get out. Because I listened to some of the numbers, you're putting in a whole lot more than the uh, eventual benefits, little meager benefits would justify. So if you could do that for the record, um, uh, I'd, we'd, I'd appreciate it. Uh, uh, Congressman Scott, I, Central States uh, pays the PBGC premium in the multi-employer space for our participants, so I'm not, I, I don't know that number. Well, if you could get it for the record after, after you I go sure home. I will. Okay, good, thank you. And I know we, we pay $6,300 a year into Central States for our people, for each employee that we have. And I know that they expect to get all of that money when they retire, but as we know, it's all at risk. Well, if you can give us those, those uh, numbers for the record uh, after the hearing, I'd appreciate it. Uh, both of you, have, um, uh, we've heard a lot about the individual effects and trying to live on this money and what happens if the money isn't going to be there or if you don't know if the money is going to be there and the effect it has on us life. Um, we've also heard about the, con the idea of contagion. Um, Mr. Gardner, can you tell me how many plans you pay into and what would happen if one goes, if your company stopped paying into all of them, what would happen to all of those funds? Well, we pay into five plans, Central States, the Cleveland Bakers and Teamsters Fund, Western Pennsylvania, uh, the BCTGM, and we pay into one more, Local 52 in Cleveland. And if we stop paying into one of those, the largest pension fund, or the mo we pay in the most money into the Cleveland Bakers and Teamsters Pension Fund because we have the most employees in that fund. If we stop paying into, let's say, that fund, then, and if we go out of business, if our unfunded pension liability is called, then all of the other pension funds will have trouble because we will be bankrupt. And what would happen to those other funds? Um, I'm not certain. Some of the funds are doing okay now, but if a couple of businesses went under and stopped paying, the contagion idea would suggest that the problem in one fund brings the business under. The other funds now become yeah. in jeopardy. Um, and then all of the uh, problems come from that. Um, Mr. Walden, you indicated um, a problem with, I think you mentioned foreclosure as a possible result. People, if they don't get their pensions, they're going to have trouble 
paying their mortgages. Um, how many of these funds have a lot of people in the same neighborhoods drawing pensions from the same plans? Well, without looking at the figures, Central States has uh, put those figures out uh, per district in every state that, that Central <coughs> States is involved in, especially in Ohio, uh, how that would affect, uh, you know, like uh, as far as foreclosure and everything, you need uh, iron workers local 17 here in Cleveland, uh, 707 in New York. Those people are already. And if a lot of people in the same city started, if uh, there's a foreclosure and you live down the street, totally unrelated to the mortgage, and you decide to sell your house, if there's a foreclosure down the street, you're going to have trouble selling your house. Well, the problem with that is that if you have uh, whatever community you're talking about and several people live in a certain community and they lose, they don't have enough money to update their property, the value of your house goes down. So when you, if it is sold, whether foreclosure or personal, yeah, it's, what it's happens, not worth what it What is. happens to the real estate values in that area? Drops uh, heavily and your property taxes. And the are property taxes pay. are affected as a direct result. Exactly, and your county taxes. It just It's a contagion effect. We, um, there's some neighborhoods in um, southwest Virginia where so many people are depending on mine workers' pensions yes. that the county revenues are in jeopardy if the fund goes under. Correct. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Congressman Scott, Congressman Norcross. Thank you. Just uh, real quickly, um, you know, when a fund is entering the red zone, as you well know, you know, there are a couple of things that can happen. It can go insolvent, which many are, or you could have the mass withdrawal. One of the things that we've realized and we've heard from testimony is that there are healthy plans and then there are yellow zone plans. The premiums couldn't be raised to a level to absorb the problem that happens in PBGC. Uh, so what we heard very clearly is Central States is the tip of the arrow. They're the one, along with mine workers, that would potentially go first. Uh, and it would take less than a year for PBGC in its present form for it to literally go out of business if something isn't done. Uh, the idea of shifting the entire burden to the last man standing on a company side is something that got us into this. We need to be extremely careful not to do the same thing to healthy plans because they need a future as much as you do. The immediate problem is what we see with the collapse of central states and the mine workers and the plan that has been put forth by uh, Richie Neal and the Butch Lewis is a condition that will address your immediate issue, which is so important to people that are in retirement or a few years. My question is, how do we prevent this from happening again? What do we need to do to make sure, certainly we heard the bankruptcy issue, but what and how can we act so that A, we take care of you with the loan program, how do we prevent the next one, Mr. Martin, from happening? Boy, I don't know. I, I, um, I know that there are three loan proposals out there uh, that, that are being evaluated, and I think we need to, because, I mean, they, they, each proposal has, has this federal loan as, as the centerpiece uh, of the proposal, and I think we need to combine all the best features of all those proposals and get this thing done. Then going forward, I think we have to be honest with ourselves on the type of benefit structures that people really want. We have a lot of young people that are now working for our company, and they actually get in arguments with the older workers about pension versus a portable benefit like a 401k. I think a lot of our younger workers, uh, when they come in, they don't expect to work 46 years like this fine lady has done. It might be 56 years <laughs> or 66 years. And they like something that's more portable and something that's more predictable that could be passed down to their family if something were to happen to them. Uh, so They want it now until they start getting older and doing the math, and then all of a sudden they want the other one, right? <laughs> right. That's yeah, the difference switch. between yeah. age and wisdom. <laughs> Right, but, but I think we have to be honest with ourselves that this, the current promises that we're making are not, are not possible. We have to look at other structures going forward that are more predictable. 
So I look at uh, our youngest panelists. When you think about trying to invest, obviously you wouldn't be where you are today if you didn't care about those who came before you. But we understand the basis for the system is that it continues and that the, the health of the program and the pension is in large part that next generation who continues to pay into it. You talked about some of the apprentices that talk to you. What answers do you give them? Do you say it's the best of both worlds? Yeah, I tell them, you know, that, you know, we're working on things to get things going. And I tell them my perspective, and I'd like to tell you my perspective as well. Um, one of the biggest problems we're here is legislation that prevented us from building rainy day funds. Like I said, in 1998, we were over 100% funded. So if we was able to remain 100% funded through 2008, maybe we would have been 70. I mean, I don't know what we would have been, but we wouldn't have been 20. Remind the rest of the panel, you were allowed to go to, what was it, 115%? 115%. And it, if you went over it, it would take away your status? It would take away our status, yes, correct. So had you had that ability, you could have built it up to 125, 130, whatever it is during the boom days, so when it came back down. So Correct. that would be one thing you would change? Yes, and then the other, um, I don't know, the UBC is international. We're one of the largest unions in the world. Our Canadian counterparts, their pension plans allow for flexible changes based on the economy. So as the economy fluctuates, our benefits fluctuates. But none of our retirees see cuts that come into 50s and 60s percents. We're talking 5 and 10 percents based on the economy as it fluctuates. So if you had a defined contribution, obviously you can do that yourself based on the market, but it does not allow you to do it with a defined benefit. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Thank I want you, to keep to my five minutes. Thank you. Congressman Dingell. Mr. Chair, I know in the interest of time that some people have planes. I'm uh, not going to ask any more questions because I want to be able to hug some of the witnesses before we <laughs> leave. But I do want to say that the purpose of today's hearing was to have a field hearing. And I am um, very glad to be in Ohio with these two senators you have who are both really good friends and they care. But you're reflective of communities throughout this country. And we need people to understand what's happening to working men and women across this country and how scared they are and how are we going to address the problem and how are we going to try to prevent it from ever happening again. So thank you for sharing your stories and uh, I hope we can help educate some of our colleagues about the realness of it. Ms. Dell. I'd like to say one thing on the question about how we could prevent it from happening again. You learn from your mistakes in life and you work at it to try to never do it again. And I think with all the difficulties that this has created, that there will be people watching, there will be people checking to make sure that this never happens again to anybody else. I'm praying and hoping for that. That's so what I we hope, and that's what we want to learn. It's our job. It is our job. Thank you. For, uh, thank you all. Your testimony has been illuminating and helpful and constructive. Thank you. Uh, anything that any of the six of you would like to say that you haven't been able to say in this hearing? Let's give you each a chance to do that. If not, I, I would like to. Uh, uh, Mr. Ward. The, I sit here thinking and, and I listen and understand the business side of it. But when we're talking about mine workers, retirees, and we know it's not a large check. And Senator Manchin has this problem more in West Virginia than we have in Ohio because he has more numbers. But the retirees that receive a check in Ohio, for a large part, live in southeastern Ohio. The business is there. Our guys aren't saving this $500 check. They're spending it either on gas or on groceries. So those businesses will suffer also. Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks to the six of you. Thanks to my colleagues, uh, the ones that drove in, the ones that flew in. Thanks for staying here and thanks to the audience and especially up in the galleys up there. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we will report. Thank you. We will. Um, Both Chris, Chris, Chris Allen, 
Senator Hatch's staff director, Gideon Bragg and my staff director, we will report this information back to the to our colleagues among the 16 of us. Um, this this is important to pensioners. It's important to businesses. It's important to all of us. So um, thank you, and the the committee is adjourned.